appreciate everybody getting sound and, and being part of this. So you'll hear from me more later, but I'm gonna we're gonna start off with our first agenda item, and I'll introduce Tony Lucas for Tony. Tony Zamet, Tony Lucas is my lost boy. Uh, Tony Zamet, our Deputy Chief Legal Counsel, to start off on some of our presentations. Thanks, uh, Chairman Stevenson. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, Tony Zamet, I'm the Deputy Chief Legal Counsel here at the Department of Revenue. Um, really quick, there was a couple of conversations that we started to have last meeting about legislative intent. And Eric Dale, who you hear from in just a minute, uh, and I started talking after this meeting about legislative intent because Megan Moore actually also mentioned that you can have statutes that specifically articulate what legislative intent is. And as Eric and I were talking, we thought it would be a really good thing for this committee to understand what legislative intent is. So hopefully over the next couple of minutes what we're already here is what legislative intent is, what the legislative intent that we currently have in statute for agricultural land is, and just some kind of priming of a conversation for everybody to think about this committee's work and hopefully the end result of having some language that goes to a committee or a committee bill or to the legislature, how we think about legislative intent going in there. So without further ado, I'm gonna introduce Stephanie Stalkup. Stephanie is a clinical law student. Uh, she's a third year at the University of Montana. Uh, here working with the Legal Services Office at the Department of Revenue full time. So she's going to take over the next part of this conversation. After Stephanie is done, then Eric is going to get up, Eric Dale, uh, who's the director of our tax policy and research group here at the Department of Revenue, and he's going to chat about a couple of further considerations that we have for this. So, Stephanie. And we do have printed copies of this presentation. It looks like it's going around now. So. Mr. Chairman and members of the committee, my name is Stephanie Stalkup and I am a 3L uh, at the Alexander Blue at Law School and I am here to talk about the concept of legislative intent. So with legislative intent, there's a couple of different step process to uh, Hold on, thank you, Blair. <laughs> There we go. Just move over. So with legislative intent, we're going to keep this really short and simple this morning um, so people with more knowledge can talk. But uh, what we're going to address is what is legislative intent and how do you find it? So step one, it is the plain, unambiguous, direct language that is found in the statute. And that is where you find the legislative intent. So when you are first looking at the statute, that is how you determine what the legislature was trying to get through through their plain meaning of words. And those words need to be taken at face value. Um, as you see here, the language of the statute must be construed in accordance with its usual and ordinary acceptance. That means its usual and ordinary acceptance of what that word typically means to everybody in this room and not a one-off. Step two, you look to the reasonableness. A reasonable construction of a statute must be adopted if possible. Great deference is going to be shown to the agency that is in charge of administering or enforcing that statute. Um, next, step three, we're going to look at the statute as a whole. And this is what I'm talking about looking at the plain language of the statute and not. Uh, and having the plain language of the words and the meaning because those are going to be reasonably and logically interpreted but the courts actually look at the statute as an entire whole so if you do have some areas that maybe aren't uh conforming with other areas they're not going to look at just one subsection and that is going to define it they're going to look at the entire statute in order to understand what the legislative intent is going into that and then we have step four. 
if the language language is ambiguous. Um, if the language is ambiguous in the construction of the statute, it is the role of the judge to simply decide um, or declare what that substance means. Uh, that does not mean that the judge is there to omit anything, and it does not mean the judge is there to add or insert anything. It needs to be just what is in front of them and the substance that can be logically and reasonably construed. So with that, we have step one, let's look to the plain language. We have step two, what is reasonable within this plain language. Then we look to step three, uh, and you're going to see that as the statute as a whole. And then step four is only if, we only get to this step, if there is something that is ambiguous in the terms of the statute that needs to be interpreted. So looking at the issue at hand, what is the legislative intent for the valuation of agricultural property? The legislative intent for determining the valuation of agricultural property is defined under statute, under MCA 157201. Sorry, I am going a little fast. Uh, so let's break this statute down and see what we're working with. Subsection one of the statute says, because the market value of many agricultural properties is based on the speculative purchases that do not reflect the productive capability of agricultural land, it is the legislative intent that bona fide agricultural properties be classified and assessed at a value that is exclusive of values attributed to urban influence or speculative purposes. Here, the legislative intent of this statute is clear. We are looking at bona fide, which means genuine or real agricultural properties that would be valued and classi classified and assessed without the inclusion of urban influences or speculative purposes. The statute uh, sets forth how agricultural land is to be valued, and that means that it, um, it excludes any of these influences that might also contribute to determining a value. That ensures that farms that are located in eastern Montana and farms that are located in western Montana are valued, um, have the same valuation process. Because as we know, there is a lot more population growth in the western part of the state than there is in the eastern part of the state. Subsection two, agriculture land must be classified according to its use, which classifications include, but are not limited to, irrigated use, non-irrigated use, and grazing use. Here, it is clear that the statute, uh, that agricultural land is to be classified according to its use under this subsection. That is the legislative intent of this subsection. Subsection three. Within each class, land must be subclassified by the productive capacity. Productive capacity is determined based on yield. So after land has been classified into one of the three categories that we saw in subsection two, it's been further uh, subcategorized into this subsection based on its production capacity, which then is based on yield. And if you go further into the statute, they give you equations and they start to get into the logistics of how those um, how those yields are equated, but we're not going to go into that because this is just a quick rundown of how to look at a statute to find a legislative intent. So what are our big takeaways from here? The best way that to convey legislative intent is to be very clear with concise language within the statute. This committee, if it enacts change um, or suggests uh, legislation or statute changes, the statement of intent needs to be as clear as possible. So there is no ambiguity on what was intended for the statute to go forward. And that cleans it up for later down the road if the courts have to decide on ambiguous language. At least the intent can be clear. So questions can be answered easily. Um, and with that, thank you for your time. I hope that this gave a quick rundown for you. Thank you. Uh, I have no PowerPoint. <laughs> uh, thanks. So, as Tony mentioned, this uh, agenda item came about based on a conversation we were having. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't able to attend the last meeting you guys uh, convened, but I did listen to it after the fact and I heard a lot of conversation about the intent 
um, of that, some of this agricultural classification was to incentivize agricultural production. I'm not entirely sure I totally agree with that premise. And so I went to talk to Tony to see if I could get some clarification where some of the ambiguity came from. And we thought it would be good for this committee to sort of partake in a similar conversation. So as they mentioned, um, if you read the plain reading of the statute, it seems to me at least that the um, legislative intent is not to necessarily incentivize agricultural production. It is to shield agricultural properties from urban and speculative influences. That's why the benefit, if you will, um, for agricultural classification can vary dependent on where that property is located. Generally in areas in the Western part of the state and are more influenced by those urban and speculative um, influences. And so the benefit of agricultural production is greater in those areas relative to the western part of the state that is typically more rural and not as influenced by those urban and speculative uh, factors. Um, so I just want this committee to sort of think about that's why the benefit is greater in one area relative to the other. So it's not that we're necessarily incentivizing, um, or it doesn't seem to me that we're incentivizing agriculture cultural production in the western part of the state to a greater extent than the eastern part of the state. It's just that those market and speculative values are greater in the western part of the state and therefore the benefit of agricultural production is greater in those areas, if that makes sense. So again, I just wanted the committee to sort of think about that as they move forward with um, potential solutions and what this committee's intent was as opposed to what the statute or the legislative intent and the statute is structured as, if that kind of makes sense. The benefit of agriculture production or the benefit of having an agriculture tax rate? Well, and this comes back to some of the confusion I was hearing at the last uh, committee, the benefit of agricultural classification, because fundamentally, if you look at the tax rate as it's defined in the statute, it's actually greater for agricultural production agricultural properties than it is for residential properties. Mm -hmm. But we all know that the taxes they pay are generally lower than what they would pay otherwise under a residential framework. And again, that's because we're shielding those properties from market and speculative influences. And those influences tend to be greater in some areas relative to other areas, if that makes sense. And so as you move forward, I think it's important for this committee to sort of think about those distinctions and what they want to do. If it is the intent of this committee to incentivize agricultural production through the property tax rate, there are other ways to do that, um, independent of productivity value, essentially. And if the intent of the committee is to sh continue to shield these properties from these market and speculative values, then um, there's going to be variance in the um, the benefit of getting that agricultural classification. That's <coughs> and that's really all I have to say, unless there are any questions or people would like to disagree with me on my sort of reading of the, uh, the current structure of property taxation for agricultural property. Could you introduce yourself so they know who you are? Oh, I apologize. Uh, my name is Eric Dale. I am the uh, director of the tax policy research uh, here in the Department of Revenue. So we can help answer any questions to the extent we can. Do you know when the uh, this definite or this uh, legislative intent was added to the code? Uh, I don't know off the top of my head. I don't know if there's the lawyers in the room. I believe it's been there as long as the statute has been there, which I think would. Nineteen seventy three was when the section was enacted, which awfully close to the constitutional convention. So I was assuming there might be something more like that. That's all I have. Go ahead, Bob. So there's a couple questions for the legal scholars here. Um, the definition that starts talking about subsection two about use, and then it says use is irrigated to irrigated grazing. Those really aren't uses. I suppose it's classification, but 
use of the production of crops, grazing of livestock, forest, forest production, basically, so it's a type of plant production. But this gets back to when, I don't know, around 2009, when it went to productive value and tried to clarify in the statute why ag land is valued like it is because it was, wasn't very clear prior to then and so it went to productive. Put in the statute, we'll use productive value and kind of define what that was. And the point then was to um, create a defensible methodology for valuing ag land as opposed to market value. And so, as I recall, the statute base says it's your productive capacity is based on your soil types, alignment, all that stuff that's included in there. And so, the legislature didn't want to incentivize bad practices or penalize good practice. So, they basically said average productive capacity of that soil type would be how the land would be classified. But it never said anything about you have to produce anything. It still doesn't say you have to produce anything. It just says if you have a acre ground that's capable of producing 40 bushel of wheat, that's how we're going to value it. You don't, you don't raise wheat or it. I mean, if you raise 60 bushel, you don't pay more if you raise 20 bushel because you don't control the wheat and fertilize, you don't pay less. But if you don't raise anything, you still get agricultural value. And so I think those two things aren't really clear in the statute as some people might think. And that's a good point to, to add to what Bob says. If, you, if you're 160 acres or above, you don't have to produce anything. You're automatically whatever that is by by definition. Right, well, man, to say your soil. Right, right. And that's that's how you're, whether you're growing elk or you're raising cows. <laughs> However, the use piece comes in to account. So in the example where you have 160 acres that you're not doing it and you don't have a crop in it, then it gets classified as grazing because right. there's no other use that you're doing with that land. Even if it's capable or at one time was farmland, if you're not using it any way as farmland now, it automatically gets kicked to grazing. How does that how does that change how much you pay for your property tax? Grazing land is the lowest. Right. Uh, I'm trying to say valuation. So it's always getting the biggest benefit you possibly could, regardless of what you're doing there, if you have 160 acres. Well, if you're farming it. If you're farming it, you pay more tax. Right. And if that 160 is irrigated, it's yeah. There's more productive capacity, right? Which is kind of again, a, not only in the statute, because irrigation is an input practice, just like fertilizer, mm -hmm. chemicals, and a lot of those things. And there was a lot of discussion at that time about whether just to eliminate the irrigated class because it's a really small portion of property in Montana, pretty much in the valley. But the political blowback of that would be you know, you're taking this sugar beet ground and saying, well, we're not going to value that as high as before. It's we're not going to count irritation as a intrinsic value of the land. It's, and is, is it right, I guess, this is my question, is it right to attach a grazing value to land that's been removed from production agriculture and nothing is being done to it because the only thing that's grazing it is wildlife. And perhaps in a lot of cases <coughs> by intent. That's a frustration. I think what Cindy is saying there is why this committee is sitting here. She she hit it right <laughs> on the head, right? I, I mean that's that was kind of the point behind those those bills that were introduced in the last session that were the reason this committee was convened is what do you do about the par the parcel that is just grazing wildlife and it used to graze cows for lack of a better word 
And non qualified land, those that fit into that category, is also a grazing productivity value as well. And what if it's in CRP? If it's in CRP, it stays in farmland until the CRP program is expired. And then if they choose to leave it as grazing, then they can file an AP 26 essentially with us saying that we've changed the use from farmland to grazing, and then we can change it to grazing from there. But while it's in the program, it stays at whatever use it went in the program as. So, no, go ahead. I am catching up to do on on the um, you know branching end of things because it's totally different from the farming I do and we do out in the uh, at Lake area. But so CRP is a, it's a program for it was conservation reserve program oh, conservation. which came out okay. of the the bad farming practices of the 70s, and then the government paid you to break it, and then they paid you to put it back in grass. Yeah, so it would be this could be this grazing land, but it's it's got a, its own classification. Oh, CRP while you're under the contract typically prohibits you from grazing it or very right. often. Okay, right, and so it's because you're on a it's a federal check you get for not using that land. Right. If we're not farming it, and then there are exceptions to grazing CRP, but okay. or hating it, drought, and things like that. So just for example, with the with the the grazing status, I mean, a, a person with a ten acre cherry orchard, his property taxes would actually go down if he took out nine acres and called it, and that nine acres would be classified as grazing. And the one acre, because he'd have the one acre would still be in cherries that he could easily. That person could easily produce fifteen hundred dollars of you know gross revenue, and so the way it's you know the way it's structured right now, you, it's, it's not a big benefit, of course, but we wouldn't have to take care of nine more acres of cherry trees, and we could still have that little classification or tax value. But I think Gary, if you're asking a question there, I'd have to ask my people that know. How that would actually work. Right. Price is not Amanda? Yeah. <laughs> That's essentially how it works. Okay. It's yeah. Once that parcel qualifies, it qualifies the entire parcel as ag, whether you're using it the full 10 acres, a half acre, one acre. As soon as it meets that qualification, it gets classified as ag. And then we're looking at the specific use of the different underlying makeup of that 10 acres and some classifying it based on its actual use, whether it's a specialty crop with an orchard, whether it's just irrigated, and then as Robin said, the default classification is always grazing. So if it isn't being used in any of the other subclassification use types, then it will always default to a grazing classification. Mm -hmm. And then how long does it stay that way until it changes hands or until the Department of Revenue sends you the postcard that says prove up? Yeah, typically we don't have a process in place now for reevaluating these parcels under 160 acres that have to apply. Mm -hmm. um, like especially the trucks in the case of the orchards, there are husbandry practices that they have maintained, but we also don't have the staff that you know go out and check every one of these properties on an annual basis to ensure that they're still meeting all of those things. So typically it's under 160 acres where you have to apply unless we become aware of a change in use type or use of that property, it's going to maintain that status until an ownership change occurs. And then that new owner would have to reapply and demonstrate that they're still using it in an agricultural capacity and meeting the 1500 or raising AUM standards. That take care of those yes. questions. Thank you. <laughs> just raise and I think just to circle back, I think that's kind of the, the point I was sort of examining when I was looking at this. It, moving those nine acres from a productive capacity of growing cherry trees or what have you to doing essentially nothing with them wouldn't make sense if the intent was to encourage production or to encourage agricultural production, mm -hmm. but it would make sense if you sort of viewed it from the lens of that's not the intent. The intent is simply to shield it from those urban and speculative forces, if that makes sense. 
If you look at 157201, whether it's shielding or it's incentivizing, probably doesn't matter because in 157201, they specifically say bona fide agricultural properties are classified. Well, if we said bona fide class agricultural properties are treated this way, bona fide agricultural properties are shielded from a tax for something other than or a from a value, something outside of agriculture, right? So are you shielded or are you incentivized? Does it really matter? Because the point is, it is treated differently if it's a bona fide agricultural property. So really to, to kind of come back around on this, I don't know if we can do it, but if the, the committee can solve a whole lot of these, of at least this perceived issue, and I think it's a real issue in some places, what's bona fide? If it's bona fide, then it's shielded or incentivized, and who cares? But because it's either it's the same thing, right? Is that what you're kind of saying, Bob? It's not the same thing, but the results might be the same. Okay. So would there be any value at this point to maybe um, redefine intent and incentivization? Um, is, is that something that we could do uh, ahead of this session? Is to put forth some kind of incentivization to um, <clears throat> add value to do the agricultural economies of the state of Montana? I don't know why that why we couldn't if 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 we actually okay, if we were taking a bill to to revenue interim committee and saying hey we want to clarify or change when with the right word legislative intent beyond what this is that I don't know why we couldn't propose something. Do I understand correctly? Uh, production wine or production ag is taxed lower than grazing. Yeah. So that's grazing is the lowest. Okay. It's value lower than um, not grazing land. But like Eric pointed out, the tax rate on grazing land is actually higher than a residence. But its value isn't as high for that acre if that acre could sell for a residence, right? right. I'm not sure that was English at all. But <laughs> if you've got well, it. Well, the market value of the parcel could be significantly greater than the than the taxable value that gets used in your calculation. Is that correct? I think that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's the right way to phrase it. Yeah. 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 So quick. At the risk of stating the obvious, uh, you, director, referenced uh, bona fide agricultural properties. And I look at the memo that was included in our uh, materials from 2001, and one quote jumps out at some buyers are purchasing large ranches for their American dream and taking land off of agricultural production. Mm -hmm. 24 years ago, that prompted individuals to take a look at this very issue. And here we are still looking at that. <laughs> so to me, and I think the reason this keeps surfacing legislatively is captured in that singular sentence. There are people who 
perceive that there's agricultural property or bona fide agricultural properties where individuals have no intent of using it for agricultural production. And the question is, should they still benefit from that tax structure? And uh, I know in 2001, the issue surfaced. I know in 2007, eight, it surfaced. And I look at Senator Beard and I think Revenue Interim looked at it in 2017, 18. Uh, and yet we still continue to have this conversation. So for me, uh, that's the crux of the problem. It, the question is, is it bona fide agricultural property? And then two, if there's not an intent to use it that way, does it still benefit from that tax rate? You put a point on it. I mean, that's what we're here for, right? Mm -hmm. And all those attempts, nobody figured it out. In fact, when Robin pulled that thing up from 2001, it was almost <laughs> verbatim what we said last week or last month. Almost verbatim. Same issues, same dollar figure. The 1500 bucks was yeah. still there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody's raising their hand. Go ahead. Yeah, Mr. Director. I, forgive me if I asked this question last time. Is there a way that we can get a handle on the, the widespread nature of this issue? I mean... If, if this is actually an issue, and I think we all, we've all seen examples of this, but can we put a number to this? I've, I think that would just really help the discussion moving forward. Let me ask you a question on that. Yeah. A number to what? Um, how, many, how many properties are actually being purchased and not used for ag that could be used for ag? There's the, there's the tricky part of this, because we don't really we don't know. Because right now it's just anecdotal. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we all, we all have examples. I have examples in my mind that come to mind. But it's anecdotal, and I hate making decisions based on anecdotal evidence. And so I just wondered if we can put a number to that in some way. If the answer is right. no, that's fine. It's, it's going to be hard to put a number to it because let's just say I decided to raise pheasants on my place instead of as many cows as I've got. So I take a thousand cows off the place, and I've got two hundred. Am I? And I do it just because I like to wear a cowboy hat. Uh, am I bona fide ag? I've got a place that will support a lot more cows than that, but I really bought a ton of pheasants. So there's, there's, we all know anecdotally, John will nod his head to this, that there's a, there's a lot of that. But the problem is, is I, I can't really pick, I don't think our people can pick and say, well, John's bona fide ag because he's running at full bore and he's fully stocked and he's farming and doing whatever. And Beatty, he's not because he's, really got pheasants, but you've got a few cows, because we don't know that. And it's all anecdotal, right? We all know the anecdotes. We can name the names uh, if we need to. Go ahead, John. Well, Mr. Chairman, I, I'm not sure we need to incentivize people to stay in production agriculture, because to me, we're telling them what, what they should do with their property. And if they don't want to be in ag, so be it, but they shouldn't, they shouldn't be taxed at the same. Right. I think we should be rewarding those that are remaining in production. Mm -hmm. so. And then how do we define production? No problems. <coughs> Back to Marcus's question. Am I producing if I'm running at 20% of my carrying capacity? Well, I, I think we have to set a dollar amount. Or it's a tough. It's at a dollar amount per acre of property you have. Mm -hmm. You have to show production agriculture income. I don't know. I know that's hard to do, but uh, I don't think you can base it on a person's gross income because a lot of these people obviously uh, have gross income elsewhere. Uh, so you know, even if they're in production agriculture and their land is absolutely producing to its entirety, probably still ninety percent of their gross income comes from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So I, I think it has to be based on a dollar amount per acre. Go ahead, sorry. Oh, you're good. Are, are you ready, John? Yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Chuck. Yeah, I um, I think that's the right approach. And mm -hmm. I'm not sure if dollar figure is the right way to go about it, but we already know what the productive value is, or we assess what the productive value is. Maybe it could be some percentage of that productive value. Yeah. yeah. Um, um, I, I hate to get too far into forcing people to prove up that they're they're meeting some percentage of that productive value. And it probably needs to be percentage because you can't control the weather. You know, nobody's probably meeting 100% of their productive value. Um, but 
but maybe it's over a period of years, you know, and, and you uh, attest that you're you're at a, some you need some threshold of, of that productive value. And if you if you can't make that attestation, then you fall out of class three property. So that Johnson was part for everything. Probably really shun at this because who's gonna I mean, I, I like the idea, but who's going to say how much? Who's going to go around and say this is what your productive value is? You have to meet this percent. And, you know, somebody, somebody's going to be on the ground doing that. That's already done. Yeah. Yeah. By the productive value of the soil type, right? And if there were a percentage or a, a capacity test, if you will, so long as you can show a commercial endeavor to make money agriculturally then you and then you need a, a percentage of capacity then you, you keep your egg production your, your revenue would be right you just get the left well but your well, the left doesn't cover everything not always yeah so let's see that uh, we had a couple of hands go up i saw bob's uh, let's wait. all right in the federal government, the IRS has a hobby farm. Right? If, you know, if you're an airline pilot and raise horses, and you can, it's not quite the same, but you can't deduct all your expenses because it's a hobby, it's not an enterprise. Mm -hmm. And of course, that was an income tax right. case, and it was actually a, a Montana income tax case. Delta Airlines pilot and his family were allegedly raising commercial horses, but they'd never sold a horse, but they rode off everything down to the lawnmower, <laughs> right? Great case if you're the tax man to say, this is baloney and we won. But yeah, that, that's an income tax. But yeah. It's, it's, it's struggle. Yeah. What I do, and I, I think John said it, uh, I really, and I don't think anybody wants the Department of Revenue deciding who's a real cowboy or a real farmer or not. Mm -hmm. Um, we are never not qualified now. We will never be qualified to decide whether you're bona fide or not on a coming out and looking at your operation. That seems like just my gut says that's government doing things it should not be in the middle of at all. So unless we come up with a definition of bona fide that makes this kind of an objective, like you're saying, maybe an income thing or probably an income thing. I mean, last I looked, bona fide agriculture should be actually trying to. Exactly. <laughs> Demonstrate a commercial endeavor. Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, LG. But then there's a difference between gross income and net income right. because you know you could have a herd slaughtered because of a brucellosis. I mean, uh -huh. it, so what is it? Gross income or is it net income? Yeah. And what do you do in the drought situation, or what do you do in the? Go ahead. I think you know, obviously you have the gross income. Yeah. Not good, good Absolutely. Good. You say there's two. I mean, a lot of these farmers and ranchers strive to break even. There is no net income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I okay. I'm gonna back up just a little bit. So I can see how you can base productivity on soil type, but I was, and I mean, I realize that I mean, the cherry industry and especially crops are a small part of the you know the state income through agriculture, but but when it comes to taxes, it is, is probably uh, a big a big concern because um, what's going on in our area. But I, I, I would like to cite an example too, just so everybody is aware of what happens out there. But um, a cherry tree will grow in, in fact, they love just gravel soil. But then they'll, again, they'll grow in great soil. I mean, but the only thing it won't grow in is bedrock or maybe really horrible clay soil or something. So I don't know how you could assess you know the productivity when you're doing a crop like that just by the soil type would be a, a, a situation but if you i mean and maybe i don't know if this is the time or not but i i just did some computations i got together with my my local um revenue uh appraisal agent there in in lake county but so and this is this is a common thing around the lake um you can have the property value is based on the front feet of lakefront. And um, so I just did a uh, calculation here of you. And not, I'm taking out all the um, capital improvements, like, you know, the residents and barns or whatever. 
But if you had a 300 foot piece of lakefront, it would on in prime lakefront is, is valued at $10,000 a front foot. So it'd be a $3 million lot. And if it was just for round figures, I use three acres. If you have one acre in ag, which is all you would need to put in 100 trees, which is the requirement. In fact, you could, you could throw 100 trees in this room. <clears throat> Some people have done it. Um, and they, they do grow um, trees on those, on those high um, concentrations like that in Washington. I mean, it's a legit way of growing cherries. Um, so you, you designate one acre for ag, one acre for home site, and the third acre is would end up be grazing land. Um, your your um, taxable amount, I used our mill levies for our county, which was 0.577, would be $42.91 on um, you know, a $3 million piece of property. If it wasn't in ag, it would be $23,368.50. So the person might throwing 100 trees in, and um, this happens a lot. You'll, they'll, they'll have their blueprint for their house. It'll be house, three car garage, 100 trees of cherries. I mean, this is this is how they design their, their lots. <coughs> The issue with it, other than them avoiding a lot of taxes for the cherry farmer, I mean, for the legit cherry farmer, is, and I, I was instrumental in helping get at that one sentence in the law that said they had to uh, keep the cherry trees disease and test free. But that's up to the um, Department of Revenue to go around and say, is this? This orchard disease and pest free or not, you know, that can be a tough call if you don't have the experience in it. So if, it, if they weren't keeping it healthy, then they could lose their ag status. But other than that, um, there's, there's a lot of orchards that, you know, they're not well cared for. They have no plan. They don't buy a tractor and a sprayer or anything. They just put trees in. And so they're, they're a source of issues for their neighbor orchards that are trying to you know, run a legit operation, such as myself. And um, you know, there'll be, I, <laughs> I don't want to go into too much detail. I find it interesting, but anyway, um, powdery mildew, Montana never, we never had powdery mildew. And it was, we realized it was introduced by some nursery stock, but. It was a it was this one orchard I called it powdery mildew hollow because it was stuck in between you know 80 foot pine trees all shady no air circulation never sprayed for powdery mildew and it just and it spreads so you know and and so that's <laughs> I mean that's my I, I just wanted to get that off my chest because that it's it's a real issue there and but the the tax savings I mean. These people are not, they're not farmers. They're just, they know there's a loophole and they're not doing anything illegal, but they're taking, they're mostly out of state and you know, they're the first ones to complain about the potholes. And it's, it's frustrating. It's like, now I, now I can go home. <laughs> <laughs> I learned something today. I never heard yeah. of powdery mildew either. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Cindy, and then I want to circle back to Mark. possible? to segregate parcels like he's talking about so that the house and the land is taxed at the value it should be and they can have their cherry trees. Mm -hmm. I mean, that would solve that problem for sure. Mm -hmm. You're going to put in cherry trees and get an ag exemption. You get an ag exemption for every piece of ground that's under the cherry tree, but not your three-car garage and your McMansion. So, yeah, go ahead, Robin, because there, there's an answer partially yeah, to that. Right. So if you're classified as non-qualified agricultural land, your acre for your house and all your buildings is valued at market value, and the remainder land is valued still at an egg value. If you're qualified agricultural land, all of it is an egg value, including the farmstead. The farmstead gets an irrigated one acre value, but it's nothing like market value. So to fix that problem, yes, that first acre that you have your house on, we could value that across the board at market value. Mm -hmm. 
like we do non-qualified agricultural land, and then the remainder would still be either qualified or non-qualified. You'll see a little bit later on in one of the presentations, there is the difference between non-qualified land value and market value is significantly different. It improves with improved non-qualified because that first acre does get a market value as opposed to an egg value. So it does improve. It still doesn't match what market value is, but it does improve with that one acre. So that would be something that we could consider is that every one acre farm site that was valued at a market value instead of an egg value. Mm -hmm. So doesn't that come in, Mr. Chair, or Mr. Director? Um, we've had um, people testify in the Ag Committee and Tax Committee who say that they're qualified ag land and their one acre um, homestead is actually the base for operations for the egg. So that's why they get you know, the, the classification they get. That would be an argument. Hey, Mr. Chair, I just had a question for Robin. So the, the tax appraiser that I talked to in our county said that that home site would be valued Market value would be two thousand and three dollars. That's on qualified agricultural property. That's the that's the highest irrigated rate per acre. Mm -hmm. So that's what those qualified egg farm site land piece gets. Uh -huh. That's current how current. And if it wasn't for the adjacent orchard, you wouldn't get that value. Correct. Right. Correct. That's correct. So I want to come back around real quick because this whole thing kicked off with Marcus's question. <laughs> and, and then we yeah. went off the rails a little bit, but not really. Um, unless somebody in my shop can answer his question, I don't think, other than anecdotally. And I'm curious about any of the any of the real estate people in the room. Do they track it? Do we track on the real estate side buying and selling real estate of this? notion of who's leaving it in age production and who may be taking it out. I don't know of a resource, I guess is my point is a, the yeah. department doesn't have a resource to go to find out how often how how this is happening. I don't I think the short answer is no. We don't why would we drag that? There's no compelling reason for us to pay any, any attention. We're happy to have sold it to somebody and they get to do whatever they want with it, right? It doesn't mean that we don't <laughs> that we don't support the idea of changing the system. I think that's probably very true, but we just play by the rules that are written, like everybody else does, right? And and it seems to me like not only are we worried about uh, protecting or whether you want to use the word incentivizing or whatever agriculture, yeah, we've actually. You know, in the in the example of your cherry farm, we're incentivizing incentivizing terrible behavior, mm -hmm. not just protecting what we want to be protected. We're incentivizing bad actors. I think if we could put a finger in that dike, we'd be halfway home. I think I think you're right. Sorry. We, <laughs> We were able to run some metrics, and maybe this will tie in after you hear the next presentation, on what would some of the revenue um, costs be property tax-wise if, for example, we changed from 20 acres to 40 acres, the non-qualified land threshold. So I think there are some metrics we can look at as we work through ideas. We just can't measure of the over 160 plus how many are really not using the land for agriculture. That's all That's all anecdotal. We don't track that, but there are some metrics we do track that can show perhaps what the revenue effects would be if, if we tinker with the under 160 or non-qualified pieces. And, it, and, she, and she's right to that. We can come up with numbers that show that. What, what we don't have is the, the big ranches that are turned and we couldn't even do it. I was thinking about that. We couldn't even really do it with the per capita that we pay because a lessee might be reporting cattle, pigs, sheep, goats, right. whatever. Well, at the time when someone can afford a piece of property that's massive, 
I know that they need you know, to keep their agriculture, they better be agriculture. So they're still in production agriculture, they're just hiring somebody else to do it. And I don't think anybody has a problem with that. The whole point is production agriculture. You want to keep it in production. So if you come from Massachusetts and pay $60 million for 10,000 acres and you're hiring somebody to run cattle, then you do you. You're not hurting the state of Montana at all. And if they bought that 10,000 acres and they leased it to me to put my cows on, go for it, right? Mm -hmm. But the anecdotal problem we're having is, is the one that bought the X thousand acres and took the cows off. Mm -hmm. And I know in like Fergus County, we could show there's fewer cows now than there were, but we've also been drought. I, some of those are coming off for one, and some of them are coming off because there's nothing to eat. Wouldn't you agree, John? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Well, I think we have to be careful too on the solutions that we're not creating another loophole. Mm -hmm. For instance, if we require them to apply for 160 acres, well, okay, I'll apply and then I'll go buy five cows and then I'm going to put my five cows on because then it's bona fide agricultural. And so I think we need to be careful that our solutions don't create further loopholes for them to be able to find. And Mr. Director, I guess that was the quiet part of what I'm trying to get at is I don't want our solution to be worse than the problem. Right? I'm not sure that we have a real clear picture. I mean, anecdotally, we have a clear picture of what the problem is, but are we losing it to people that just want to hunt? Are we losing it to people that want to farm pheasants? And whatever we come up with, my guess is that a lot of these people are probably going to have enough money that they can just meet whatever that threshold is, and then if we actually solve the problem. And so I'm just a I spent a lot of time doing a lot of Googling, and I'm glad that you also don't have the answers because Google didn't have the answers. <laughs> so, I'm just, I'm trying to, I'm just trying to wrap my head around, you know, what what direction are we headed in, and do we raise the floor to the extent that we actually get at the problem, or do we just create more loopholes and we're back here in another five years having the same discussion as the good representative noted? We've been wrestling with this for a while, yeah. and here we still are. So that was. Thank you for saying the quiet part out loud. <laughs> Go ahead, Mark. I mean, it seems to me like we keep circling back, and what we're what we're really talking about mostly is incentivizing egg production rather than shielding land bags. Because, yeah. right, like you know, if somebody comes and buys a big ranch and they take it out of egg production, who cares? If we tax them a little more, they probably don't care either because they just want a ranch. Mm -hmm. But then we start back to say, well, we want it in ag production or we're going to not incentivize them to have ag production. So I guess what's what's the committee's direction on what we're trying to accomplish? I think that's what everybody's... That's the question. Yeah. <laughs> and it, Pretty clear that that's been what they wrestled with since 2001. Right, and we're, it's the same the same problem. And I'm going to take two more questions, then we better get on with the presentation. Oh, okay. So, so who's first? You guys. Oh, okay. I don't care. I was just curious because I was reading through all the you know the different um, tax programs for the, the different states, and in Idaho, I wonder how this works. If you have you know, good faith use. The honesty and intention of the ag production activity is for the purposes of actual true farming. I mean, obviously that's ambiguous, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if that, <laughs> being, uh, you know, that would solve. <laughs> now I got to test your integrity. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder how that works for them because it was all my issue. But, yes. Yeah, so if you got somebody from the government deciding whether or not yeah. you were honestly doing that, do you really want that? Yeah, right. So, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I was going to say my my staff and legal would have a very hard time at that trying to prove someone's intent is almost an impossible legal standard. Yeah, uh, you're almost getting into we're going to be less. How dare you? Okay, Bob had something to say, and then we're going to move on with the, with uh, presentations. I think we got two weeks. You know, deal with the small track stuff. Deal with the big. If we can buy for people is a deal one or the other or one and then the other and we're bouncing back and forth and where you know. yeah i'm glad you said that because I, I think that's what the lieutenant governor was about to yeah. elbow me about all right let's move on with our present if everybody's okay with that we can move on with a little more information here to help us out
Good morning, everyone. I'm Jared Isom. Um, I work with Eric here at the Tax Policy and Research Division of the Department of Revenue. I put together this memo memorandum on uh, how other states find and classify their agricultural land, um, just so we can get some other ideas. And I'm just going to review that really quick. Um, so one of the biggest takeaways is that Montana is the only state that has an automatic qualification based on the acreage. Every other state requires the land to be used for agricultural purposes. Um, and Montana is the only state that has anything like the non-qualified agricultural status that we have. It's either agricultural land and it's assessed on productivity, or it's not agricultural land and it's assessed at market value. There's nothing in between those two um, classifications. Um, and then a few states um, have income requirements. They vary depending on acreage and lease status. They vary from $100 to $1,500. Um, so, as you know, $300 in Montana's, there's no, not higher than that of these, the 10 states that I looked at um, in this memo. Um, although South Dakota, you could argue, is a little different. They have either an acreage requirement or $2,500 um, income for revenue. Requirements. So, and then, how to obtain the agricultural classification? Basically, every state requires an application um, to, to receive this uh, classification. There are some land in Oregon that they classify as exclusive farm use that the county has determined. And they don't have to apply if you qualify for that. But every other state and every other land in Oregon has uh, an application requirement to receive agriculture. Um, if you go through and read the rest of the Memo summarizes all of the statutes of all these different states. Yes, before we get far from it, yeah. since Montana is about the only state that has statewide state appraised, and the other good kind, do um, people apply to the county for that application? I believe so. Yes, I know in Oregon you do, because and South Dakota, yeah, everyone that that does county assessment, you, it's all based around the county. Yeah. Um, and South Dakota, actually, the acreage requirement varies. The counties set their own. It can't be over 160, but it, it, it's, it varies depending on the county and what acreage is. So that's why it's all based on the county. Um, yeah, some of the, uh, you can see some of the statutes are a little bit more specific than others. Some are very broad. Um, Washington's, I tried to summarize them as best I could, but some of them were hard to summarize because they were very specific. Um, your, your PowerPoint's not advancing at all, so we're Oh, not yeah. Oh, it's not really a PowerPoint. It's, oh, just okay. the, it's just the memo that oh, okay. you should have. Yeah, right. yeah sorry. I haven't been scrolling as I've been going, but yeah, it's just the, it's just the memo. <laughs> sorry. Is, um, is it in the... It's in the stuff that we got just last, sent last right. week. Okay. Yeah, there's like 10 things you got in the email on this yeah. one. <laughs> <laughs> Is there any prefer to have a hard copy because I can go make some copies of it? Yes, that'd be good. <clears throat> so you can read through that once you get it. Sorry that we didn't all read it beforehand. Um, but those, those are the highlights um, and the, the main differences between Montana and some of the places. But again, you can read through it and uh, let me know if you have any questions here or later. Yeah. For, for the states that require an application, how frequently are, are landowners having to make that application? Mm -hmm. I didn't look at that specifically. I think annually, probably for most of them. Um, but I don't know for sure. Uh, I'm sure some of them are like Montana, where you just, they receive the application and kind of go and build, you know, what, what land changes the ownership of them. Um, I can't look into that though. For, for you. <clears throat> no questions now. So if nobody's got any questions for, for Jared, why don't we have Amanda stand up and talk about non-qual inequities?
Good morning, Mr. Director, members of the committee. Um, you all received track land versus non qualified agricultural land classification in your email. And I, we can also get you a hard copy of that if you would like a lot of feedback. Since the inception of non qualified agricultural land in 1993, parcels of land 20 to less than 160 acres under one ownership that do not meet the requirements or have not applied to be classified as bona fide agricultural land have been valued using the statewide average grazing productivity. This means that regardless of where the parcel is located, it receives the same value per acre of $55.08 for the 2023-2024 cycle. The tax rate for non-qualified agricultural land is 15.12% or seven times that of qualified agricultural land, which has a tax rate of 2.68% as we discussed earlier. If we take the value per acre at $55.08 and by the current tax rate of 15.12%, that's $8.33 taxable value per acre. Home sites on non-qualified agricultural land are valued as a class four residential and are based on comparable land sales, while the remainder of the land is again valued using the statewide average grazing productivity. So the comparable land sales that all derive what the sales are doing in that particular area during the time that those sales are being collected for the market model for that cycle. So what the comparable sales in Eastern Montana are probably going to be different from Western Montana. So your value per acre is going to, to vary. Since non-qualified agricultural land is based on size under one ownership, there are a few possible inequities. One being track land versus non-qualified agricultural land. What I have here are some slides of comparison or excuse me, comparing non-qualified ag land to track land. And the land sizes are not that, um, are not that difference in size. We're talking 20 acres versus 20, 15 acres. As you can see, parcel A on this, on this example, parcel A is in track land. It's 15 acres. Land value is 264,911 which creates a taxable value of 3,576, which is a tax amount of $1,926.75. But then if you look at parcel B right above it, it's just a smidge over 20 acres. The land value is $1,102 with a taxable value of $167 with a tax amount of $89.98. There's a few of these in your handouts that you can review. Um, again, another one on the next slide, I'll zoom to another county. This one is in Gallatin County. Let's look at parcel C. It's 19.991 acres. It has a value of 831,000. 174 with a taxable value of 11,221 with a tax amount of $3,467.29. But then if you look at parcel D, that's 20 acre, 20.032 acres, it has a land value of 357,348 with a taxable value of 4,968 and a tax amount of $1,535.11. So not much land size difference there, but a whole lot of difference in their tax, taxable value and tax dollars. Just to give everybody the perspective, that's a quarter section. These are, these are parcels are not very far apart. You know, you look at that, you don't, can't really tell how, how big we're looking at, but I think that green's a quarter, the two greens there are a quarter quarter. So if we're talking, Parcel B and parcel C are basically 40 acres apart. So, Amanda, the parcel B, um, that has a value of 
$1,102. Yeah. And is that because there's no improvements on parcel? And it may be. Uh, I'm no, not. that is. Yeah. Okay. So this is kind of getting back to Cynthia's question from earlier about the qualified at home site versus how we treat non qualified forests. This is this example clearly illustrates how value in the one acre at market value kind of closes the gap. If you compare parcel A, B, and D with each other, so parcel B is the one that's non-qual because it's slightly over the 20 acres. It's valued at the 1100. Parcel A is vacant. It's slightly under 20 acres. So it's all valued at that market value to get you that 831,000. And then if you just scroll up slightly to that parcel B, where parcel D is still non-qual, but because it has that one acre site valued at market value, it's valued at 357,000. So it kind of closes that equity gap when you have that one acre value at market versus the one acre on qualified ag that's given the ag value. But it, you can still see, depending on the county and the area, there's still a pretty good discrepancy between the eight and the 350. We have a few more county examples oh, that we can run through. Amanda, can we let Bob ask a question oh, here? Yes, please. Well, just go back to that last yes, slide. Absolutely. <clears throat> so I've got to subdivide that quarter in the 20 acre tract. Mm -hmm. Just some of them were a little over 20, some of them were a little under 20. He had no intention of having a 19.89 or a 20.01. It's just when you surveyed it out into 20 acre tracks, some of them were above and some of them were below. And that's the tax ramifications of the policy on what happened with that particular subdivision. And this is what we get a lot of calls and people complaining about because one of the first things people do with human nature when they get their tax bill is they jump on the cadastral site and they say, okay, well, what is my acre pay? Is it reasonable? And when you're the parcel A or the parcel B and you look at your surrounding neighbor, you're the parcel D and you look at your neighbor directly south of you and see that they're valued at $1,100 on the pay and you know, $50, $60 in taxes and you're paying substantially more. That's the big thing that we get a lot of questions on it's hard to explain to people other than saying, well, it's what the law says. There's a distinction that we do not have a clear justification, and it's hard for people to understand that and think that it's a fair system. Because mm -hmm. again, these are both residential parcels. There is no ag use on them. For all intents and purposes, they're identical parcels, except for a tenth of an acre or a twentieth of an acre that puts them over and there's and there's no variance for intent <laughs> which is a rounding error really you know <laughs> that's well, unfortunate well, I'm sorry, so this, no, I'm not. this is a result of the subdivision law in the 70s and everybody that thought they might subdivide jumped in and subdivided in the 20s because then you were exempt Surveying isn't an exact science, as you can see, but it's pretty close. Now, I think there, you know, if the, if the law was still in effect, they divided it into 22 acre tracks and left them, had one small track, then everybody would have been over. You know, but that's just the way it worked out. Nobody knew how it was. Nobody knew you could do that kind of a measurement. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't know how the department determined those acres. You know, if you go into the ASCS office and determine acres, they just take a map and draw a line around it and tell them, well, you move that much with your pencil. Can they? I don't know. The department gets those acreages though right off the plat. Yeah, that was surveyed though. Yeah. Okay, so yeah, we're we're not making that up ourselves. Like somebody else. Is making that up. <laughs> we're just taking. Yeah. <laughs> go ahead, Mr. Director. I'm a little confused. Um, because both B and D are slightly over 20 acres. Mm -hmm. So that's again, B and D is the perfect example, kind of going back to your example in the conversation from earlier. Yeah. The non qual, that one acre site, so parcel B has a house on it. So there's a one acre site carved out, 
And since this is a waterfall property, that one acre site is valued at market value versus the qualified ag where it's still in the ag right. value. Okay. So that's the difference. So the, tw the 20 acre rule didn't really make a difference in this situation. It was just- Oh, it still does. So parcel well, B I mean, is vacant. B and B. Yeah, parcel B, B is vacant. Okay. So it right. doesn't have the one acre site pulled out and valued at market. That's the difference between right. B and the end of B. Okay. And that's where if you compare parcel um, A and B. B with A, then you can see that parcel A, that's just the tract that's land, that's about the same size as parcel B, right. and close that gap some valuing the one acre at market value, but there's still a pretty considerable gap. Right, okay. And again, this is gonna vary greatly across the state. Like this is a Gallatin County example, which so that gap's gonna be much larger, yeah. say, than if you're in yeah. one of the Eastern counties. That's counties. a Custer County example. And in Custer County, you can see parcel A, which is track land, vacant, seventeen point two nine. Is on hundred valued at one hundred six thousand seven hundred fifty seven, with a taxable value of one one thousand four hundred forty one, with a tax amount of seven hundred ninety two, and then you can look at parcel B, which is a non -qual qualified agricultural vacant parcel of twenty three point six acres, has a total land value of thirteen hundred dollars, a taxable value of one hundred ninety seven dollars, and a tax amount of one hundred eight. So the, the taxable amount is that, that in this particular county is in this is it seen as great because of market sales. Um, and then you have to C and D, which are improved parcels. Uh, once the track land is 16 acres, a little over 16 acres at 104,906 with the taxable value of 1,416 and a tax amount of 778 with a non qual parcel that has an improvement on it. So one acre breakout for a home site at 22 acres, 0.331 is 46,574 with a taxable value of 791 and a tax amount of $434.78. So as Bryce was saying, it does vary across the state just depending on which county and area you, that you're going to be in. So the non-qualified function of this is just simply that it's not being used for agriculture? It's it's simply that it's over that 20-acre threshold that's in statute. So it's not necessarily that it's not used for ag. It could be used for ag. It might just not be able to meet the qualifications for true classified ag status. Non-qual is simply if it's above 20 acres between below 160 and either can't meet the productive capacity to get classified as ag, or I don't know that we have an example, the taxpayer chooses not to get it classified. And again, if you go back to the grazing classification versus the irrigated, if you're a small acreage producer under that 160 acres, which is another inequity that gets created potentially, is because you have to apply for ag status we don't look at the use of that property and classify it by its use like we do parcels over 160 acres mm -hmm. because they haven't applied to us. So if you have 140 acres of irrigated hayland, it behooves you under the current system to not apply to us to get classified as ag status and get the irrigated grazing classification and productivity value and stay in non fault because there's a, a significant savings with you being classified as non ball So that's another inequity, is if I had 159 acres of a irrigated field, because I'm under 160 acres, I have to apply before we can do anything with that. If you don't ever apply, or if I don't ever apply, you're gonna be classified as non ball If you have a field right next door in, that's 161 acres, that's irrigated, now that you're over that 160 threshold that automatically qualifies for grazing, we're going to assess you as irrigated land and you don't have a choice. 
automatically get that 160 threshold. And now we have to classify or subclassify that property within bona fide ag status as its use, which is irrigated. So again, that's going to create an inequity in essentially two identical parcels right next door just because of that 160 acre magic threshold that as soon as you cross it, you're automatically classified. We have to subclassify it based on its use versus if you're under, you're not involved unless you apply to us. And then it incentivizes you not to apply to apply for that ag classification because it's going to give you a lower value to classify as not law. Go ahead. Um, we just had a few more examples if you guys would like to look through them. Uh, here's one in Beaverhead County where it's two and they're both improved. One's in track, one's in non -fall. One's 19 acres, the other one's 20 acres. The track land improved land value you can see is 242658 but the taxable value of 3276 3, and a tax amount of 1545.91. The non-fall parcel that is improved, 20 acres, has a $75,251 value with a taxable value of 1161 with a tax amount of $524.86. So almost, almost half, well, under half, plus than half. One more county that we had in Madison. Track A is 0.88 acres with a land value of six million five hundred and eighty thousand seven hundred and sixty one. Taxable value of 88,840 with a tax amount of $16,582. And there's no improvements on it. It's vacant land. This must be up at Big Sky or something, right? This is this is the club. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I'm looking at that. Yeah. Don't look at it. So then we have <laughs> yes, if you look at club. parcel B, that's contiguous. So it, it qualifies as a qualified egg because it is contiguous under one ownership. It's only it's 1.34 acres. It has a value of $74. It has a taxable value of $11 and a tax amount of $2 and five cents because it's contiguous to that larger person B. I think this is an interesting example because another wrinkle caveat, you know that within the club, they are probably restricting you from being able to do any agricultural mm -hmm. production on that parcel if you wanted to. I mean, they aren't gonna let you graze cattle up there. They're not gonna let you grow a, you know, a corn field up there. So, so I couldn't sell a hundred cherry trees. And then the last two on the slide, I'm gonna just scroll down. So can parcel B subdivide or like can they partition off pieces of their parcel under contiguous ownership still? Or how does how do these parcel lines get created? I mean, in this example isn't your typical example because the Yellowstone Club created an exclusive number of lots. They don't allow you to subdivide your own lot. This is just the stance of this person bought those two lots next to each other and happened to hit that 20 acre threshold. You know they paid millions of dollars for that smaller lot B. So this is a different example than your typical example. But if it was a typical example that you did have the ability to subdivide that property, you could subdivide that into 10 lots. And as long as it remains under your same ownership and meets that 20 acres, it's going to remain qualified as non fall status. Now, as soon as there are 10 lots in line with each other that gets you, say, 10 two acre lots, as soon as you sell one of those lots in the middle, you break that 
in continuity, and now it all will change the track land because you don't have that 20 contiguous acres. I have, I know one person in particular in the area where I live, and the gentleman is very, very good at this. He is also divided. We're talking acre lots to acre lots. And he's very particular on which lots he's going to sell in order to keep that contiguity and keep his non fall for everything we need. And that's okay because it's, it's legal. You know, I want to make sure we're not looking like we're passing the judgment on what anybody's right. doing because that the law allows it to yeah. do that. And this is a great example of these inequities we're talking about. But really, this guy's got what is it? A listen, parcel B is one acre, mm -hmm. and he's paying two dollars in, in the Yellowstone Club, and he's paying two dollars. She or whoever is paying two dollars and five cents. <laughs> In property yeah. taxes on that 1.88 acre lot, but if you lived in Ennis and you had that, you'd be paying thousands. Same county, or even right next door. Parcel A is a good example. Yeah. 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 Parcel, there's no way. So if parcel B were to sell, it would right. yeah. 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 go yeah. to the six million range. Yeah, the next purchaser is going to have a big tax bill if, you, if if this person ever sells parcel B. So, in the last few minutes, we've continued to hear the word inequity. And I think legislatively, our charge is to make sure we have a fair and equitable tax system. So, if in fact it's the view of this committee that there are these inequities, I think we're compelled to do something. So, the question that's rattled around again for 20 plus years is can we wrestle with this and can we establish some appropriate parameters? But if in fact inequities exist, I think we're compelled to do something. I don't think status quo continues to be an option. That was pretty well said. Go ahead, Bob. So if I was the guy that owned parcel D and I just put a bunch of townhouses and rented them out and never sold the land, would I still be not for land? You would have a, your home site breakouts at for full market value, but everything else would remain in on call. And sure. the thing about a parcel that size, because it's 25 acres, so as long as all of the improvements weren't, weren't on the same one acre, we could have multiple one acre sites, and then that would double every time we added another acre, it would go from 6 million to 12 million. So as long as they weren't all congested on the same one acre, we could add additional one acre sites. But I think that's kind of Bob's question, right? So say if you, we, Bob and I own this and we take one acre of that and we put a bunch of condos on it, right? We yeah. condoized yeah. one yeah. acre. The ownership of land. All you right. did is park a bunch of improvements on it. The improvements will get taxed. Yeah. Why I mean, the land is significant. Well, the one acre would get taxed. If, if, if we took that one, I think there's a yeah. question mark after that for the brains over there. In the non qual example, it would be broken out in tax that is market value. If this was qualified ag land, then it gets to a separate issue outside of this group is should short term rentals, should multifamily dwellings be considered a commercial use versus a residential use? Because how we tax them now, they get the residential tax rate the underlying land the only real exception to that is mobile home parks it's a mobile home park that whole property is commercial but i don't think it's clear if you're just putting up an apartment complex that that currently we don't classify that as a commercial use it falls into the residential it gets the residential rate so that would be a maybe a question outside of this group that again isn't really clear in statute necessarily right now. Uh, you get into a more of the short term rental argument versus the apartment stuff, which I don't think we probably want to do. Uh, don't you think we have a on, a, on a condo situation on parcel D, because let's say that they built some um, trails and you know they're using the rest of parcel D for the inhabitants of their condo unit. So the common ground would be all of parcel D, which is the 25 acres, which would fall under non-fall. So each 
condo unit owner then would get a portion of the land value distributed to their condo, but still because of its size, it still would be classified as non qualified. Did that get you? Sorry. Or, yeah, yeah, it made it worse, didn't it? <laughs> no, it did for me. <laughs> Go ahead, Amanda. You must, Bob, must <laughs> no. make this worse. No. <laughs> <laughs> People figure ways around it. So if we look at 15, 7, 103, section 2, it states all lands must be classified according to their use or uses. And 15, 7, 103, subsection 5, or 5, states all agricultural lands must be classified in a phrase as agricultural lands without regard to the best and highest use of adjacent or neighboring lands. Because non qualified agricultural land is included, with agricultural land in class three property, it may be one of the reasons why highest and best use is not part of the appraisal process for non-qualified land. This current classification evaluation system is for non-qualified agricultural land has created concern about fairness, consistency, and other inequities among property owners throughout Montana. <laughs> I've got a question for you. Um, since you put all this data together, which I think is really helpful, would it be possible to total the amount of non qualified agro land in the state? So we know you can know so how much of it there is and, and maybe break it down by county? Yeah, so that's the next. We're going right into that what? right now. Oh, you got that. <laughs> What's your <laughs> It seems to be the logical place to go after. Well, I, I've, got a, I've got another question. Then. Go ahead. Um, and can somebody remind us why we have not qualified, why we have this classification in the first place? What was the problem they were solving in 1993? Well, that the guy might so. have been part of the problem. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was not in 1993. I just happened to be with the guy who used to sit on the end bench in the lobby. <laughs> who did this and it was just the case of they had a lot of out in his part of the world sydney east of montana a lot of this 20 acre track stuff but people were moving out of town and building on it and there was no they didn't have any of the benefits of residents they didn't have water they didn't have sewer they didn't have garbage collection had all that stuff so they yeah you know, well we're not going to tax these guys as residential on 20 acres because they're not getting they're providing all their own infrastructure but we need to tax them more than if it was just ag land because you got roads and you got extra usage is it we'll just tax it seven times grazing because most of that track land was grazing land in his part of the world that, that was his what he told me about why it happened that's probably why it happened it wasn't any yeah. scientific Thing. Yeah, it's following the sub. It, it's sticking the tax law, kind of superimposing on subdivision law, right? Instead of ag or qualified or whatever, it just it just kind of follows what the subdivision laws were at the time. Is that? Well, yeah, we get we get some more money out of those tracks without overburdening with residential value, which this gets back to something before most people's time in here was in the mid '80s. The state decided they wanted to tax that one track, or they wanted to value wells and septics and all that stuff on farmland. And then they were going to redo There were busloads of ag people who came to Helena and had moved the hearing down to the Civic Center and ended up not doing that and doing some study. And that changed kind of the way all ag was valued, but that's when it got to be the Acre under the home farmstead was your game, no matter where it was, as opposed to market value. Interesting. So stuff happens, you know, when you try to change stuff, stuff happens too. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't print this off because we had statewide numbers and then broken down by every single county, so it'd be 50 some pages. Um, but this is on the website. On the landing page for the committee, I believe it was emailed to y'all. This is kind of some of the statistics that uh, the TPR pulled together showing 
kind of a breakdown between the class three classification between qualified and non qualified, uh, showing a statewide total, but also broken down between the zero to 20 acres, 20 to 160 acres, and 160 acres and above. Um, I won't go over this in detail. You guys can look this over. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to us. We just wanted to kind of put some caveats out there. These are approximations when you're talking contiguous ownerships. We kind of have to make some assumptions when we pull those numbers together. Um, and some things that just we wanted to put some context behind because you're probably thinking after the things we've told you repeatedly that there's some discrepancies in these numbers. Uh, the first of which, class three, the first grid on the left here. Uh, we might ask, well, if this is zero to 20 acres, why are there um, 1,185 taxpayers that get non qual So some of the things that can happen there is this is generally just pulling the acreage in that classification. So if you think of forest land, if you have a 25 acre parcel and say 17 acres of that qualifies as forest land, the remaining eight acres, because that parcel is still over 20 acres, that remaining eight acres would get qualified as non-qual land unless they apply to get it in qualified act status. So that's kind of, you know, some of those caveats of why that number you might say, hey, you just told us that it has to be 20 acres or greater. Why are you showing us that there's parcels that are less than that? That's kind of forest land. Uh, same thing when we just went over those examples with the non-qual that have a one acre site pulled out for the residential dwelling. Some of these numbers can be that you have that 20 acre parcel exactly with a house on it. So we're pulling out that one acre, putting it on as market land, and then the remaining 19 acres are non qual So again, that might show up as being classified as non qual less than 20 acres, but it's truly because that whole parcel is there. Same thing, sometimes rolling up by ownership. If we have common names that can skew the number, you know, you have a John Smith in a county, it's hard for us to distinguish if this John Smith is the same as just this John Smith or if they're two different John Smiths. So we just wanted to kind of provide these numbers to you if you're curious to look at that breakdown between qualified and non-qualified total taxpayers, total parcels, total acreage, taxable value, market value, taxes. Um, but just know that this is an approximation based on some of these different factors that come into play with us trying to be at the 50,000 foot level and group things based on their ownership, based on whether they're actually continuous with each other or not. So they're not exact, but they're a pretty good approximation of how that is broken down statewide. And then, like I said, the stuff that's on the website is broken down so you can look at how that's distributed amongst every county in the state. Do you want to have any questions on that? Yeah, Bryce, would you scroll up just to the top one to just try to boil this down? And I'm, just, I'm mostly going to ask a question. Really, this kind of weirdness we were looking at on this part, past parcels when Amanda did this is the upper right hand corner, right? There's approximately 31,000 of these non-qual lots that look like that, that have the crazy disparity. Is that, is that a good way to phrase that? Yes. I mean, if we're boiling this down to this inequity thing that we were talking about with representative thing, there's 31,000 of these. Go ahead, LG. Oh, oh. I'm, just scratching my head. I'm just trying to, I'm so lying. Um, <laughs> that might be something that this committee can, we've got to, if they're really, if the committee believes there are inequities in that track, in that category, that ought to be something we should look at because that really is where the, we have objective data from these things that might show there's some in it if the committee were to agree to that or agree on that is a better way to phrase that. So I boiled that down right, right? There's about 31,000 of those weird questions. Yeah, and we don't have the numbers here. I would say, I don't know, probably, 80%, 75 to 80% of non qual tracts all fall probably between 20 and 40 acres. So the vast majority of the non qual properties fall 
size wise, probably in that 20 to 40 acre range. There's not nearly as many of those small fall parcels that are above 40 acres. Let's just start getting into the so if you say 25,000 of those taxpayers are going to get a significant tax increase. Does that calculate roughly? You know how much if you kick them out of non wall and throw them in the market value, what kind of money you're talking about? We, we can to an extent. Um, we obviously have our models that are broken down and say this is what the base rate for an acre is, this is what the residual rate is. The thing that I maybe caveat is when you're starting to get into these bigger, bigger acreages, our models aren't really designed for those big acre parcels. So we would potentially just be estimating that value based on the sales we do get of you know zero to 20 to 25 acres. We would probably have to do some analysis and look at would we need to develop specific large acre models to account for you know economies of scale and diminishing marginal return that you see as you start increasing in size? So we can provide an estimation just using our current models, just with the understanding that we would have to do some analysis. We would also need time to be able to collect the sales information on those larger tract sales to develop a model. So we can provide an estimate, but we would definitely need to do further analysis to see if using our smaller acreage models really fit these type of properties or not. Just to follow up on Mr. Story's comment, though, with the exception of the 101 state bills, it's not an increase in revenue. At the county level, uh, what you would see is a redistribution because those people that are residential taxpayers or other tax classifications would essentially see their taxes go down because of the increased revenue that generated from these parcels. Correct? If you're structured by the statute on that. Right now you can reclassify and you can use that to property. That's just a yeah, bit of detail there, but I, I think Representative Payne's right, right? It increased the overall, assuming you know, arrived at the tax you know, classification of value and tax increase, they increase the taxable valuation in the county, which would then drive everybody's mills down. But that person's value probably went way the heck up. And so, even though he has fewer mills, he's still got other than that. That individual would see a tax increase, but the taxpayers at large in the county would see a decrease because of decreased mills. All right, yeah. Thank you. How many of those? 25, 30,000 people are going to be in the capital building. Yes. Yes, exactly. That's right. Well, I'll point to Representative Face. <laughs> well, I just want to point out what Bob was saying earlier in the 90s why the 20 acres in this non qual thing came about. It was some something to do with the notion that those parcels are unapproved and they have to put in their own services and roads and all of that kind of stuff. And I just want to point out that our valuation system is much more robust than it was in the 90s. And we take, we can we can look at those sales and analyze those sales. So what are they paying for those 20 acre parcels that are unapproved essentially? Or how much is it, what are they paying? We're looking at the sales. So if there's a bunch of these on the edge of billings, as an example, because there are some of these on the edge of building billings, we're going to still analyze and apply a market value to what those lots are selling for. And if it is further out in the middle of the boondocks, we're going to take that into account too, because it's going to cost more to pull in those services than it is on somebody that's on the edge of town. So those market values for those acreages greater than 20 acres can be accomplished and taking those considerations into account in this day and age, and maybe in the 90s, we could have done that. The Lieutenant Governor had her hand up for a while ago when we ran over the top. We actually um, were talking about a bill, drafted a bill in, was it 2023? I've lost track, 2023. Yeah, yeah it was 2023. That did push the 20 acres up to 40 acres. And we did run some data on what county by county as well statewide what that would cost it as subject to these caveats so i mean we could do that analysis again and um 
we could not find a legislator to carry that <laughs> because of the 25,000, enough of them heard about what was going on. Um, we're calling the legislators. We reached out to to potentially carry it and convincing them that it was, was a dead bill. I'm sure that the Realtor Association is behind the, the underlying lobbying effort to call your representative and warn them as they're not going to be after that. I'm sure that's true. <clears throat> But yeah, four to eight is fine. I, you know, that's really getting that last bit of data isn't worth it most of the time. That's why we went with the 40 acres. We understood that 75 to 80 percent of them were and between then, 20 and 40. And there are different options. We didn't provide any of that because you know we want you guys to be the ones that propose stuff. We have some different alternatives we ran that if you're interested, we more than happy to share. If you go back to those non fall map comparisons, you saw how that one acre home site closed the gap a little bit. I mean, there's options as far as making a mandatory one acre site on all non fall parcels, for example. So you can, there's different things that we've done some analysis on in the past that if the committee is interested in, we'd be more than happy to share that and present on that as well. So it, we looked at a number of options when we were working on that bill draft that was a range of eliminating it, removing that threshold, making this mandatory one acre site that closes that gap but still gives you some benefit. I mean, so if the committee's interested, we'd be more than happy to put those numbers together and show them to you at the next meeting. Since Montqual is in class three and start to put the market value on those. Acres under those homes, and you're not you're running the problem not putting on every homestead in class. I mean, we already have there's already that differentiation between qualified and non qual. So, yeah, something for this group to definitely consider, but I'm not going to tell you anyway. <laughs> put him on the spot. So, as Representative Thane said, let there be, if everybody in this in this room agrees there's an inequity, by definition, fixing an equity an inequity, somebody's bill bill goes up. That, that's the definition of an inequity, right? If if one person is unfairly paying more than the next person that looks effectively just like them, and we're trying to fix an inequity, somebody's taxes go up. Better buckle up. Because that's the deal. At the risk of sounding too blunt. It's true. Yeah. Well, that's all we had on that. The other thing I was just going to mention briefly, we aren't going to present on it because it's not our material, but I think we included the Lincoln Land Institute study that was sent out to everyone. Um, that's just for your reading pleasure. Uh, it's nothing we produced, so don't associate it with DOR, but it is there. We're not going to present on it. Um, just again, it is a bigger picture nationally, but different states are doing. Maybe the one takeaway there that the committee has been focused on should you incentivize ag. The summary from a lot of states that maybe is worth consideration is a lot of their laws are geared more towards stopping urbanization, urban sprawl, and is there some validity and uh, beneficial tax treatment to keep open space and larger tracts? So maybe something else for the committee to ponder on outside of just the incentivizing ag production, but is there value? Because that's the, the summary I took from reading that was a lot of states this is much about preserving open space as it is incentivizing agricultural production. Thanks, Bryce. Uh, something I just want to point out before we take a lunch break. Is it lunch break time? I think so. The, I want to thank my whole crew that stood up here and put all this together for us and put all that effort in. All this stuff is uh, in addition to their 
daily jobs that are full time and then some. So, and they did a great job. I want to thank them and appreciate it. Yeah. Take a break. I think the pizza showed up, didn't it? Yes. Or do you want to do your PTAC update after everybody's had a bite? Yeah, yeah. Taking a break? Absolutely. Yeah. And I don't want to stand away from you and pizza. No one's in there. Oh, sure. Good. Back. Should. Yeah. 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 Ye
website for the Department of Revenue on the opening page. There's a something about committees, a new button, and this committee is there. And I expect that we'll add a link there for the Governor's Property Tax Advisory Council. Um, Director Osmondson specifically said yesterday uh, that they were not going to delve into the same territory as this committee. They're, they're looking for this committee to report out to them on a frequent basis about their findings and recommendations. So uh, you were talked about there and there's an expectation that we'll, whatever comes out of this, we'll filter into that, but they're not going to look into their line. Questions? Thanks. Brandon? Sorry, I'm answering texts. <laughs> we still have five minutes till we can uh, kick in again. So. Oh, them. Yep. Yeah. So that's why I thought I had a minute to answer all these damn texts. Gotcha. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure I'm the only guy that gets all those, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't keep my phone in my pocket. Oh. Just need to tell Mike, no, don't leave the cows. <laughs> <laughs> Is it snowing up there? Um, Kim said it was coming down a little bit. But... We're back on schedule. Yeah, we're back on schedule. We're back on the record here. So I think, and I didn't bring my my uh, agenda with me to do this. So that's not the agenda. This is the agenda. So we, our last meeting recap: the parking garage items. I'm going to go over those real quick, just so we're back to where we where we finished off last last go around. So if everybody remembers, we had the white flip chart up there that kind of took everybody's ideas and wrote them down. And then we boiled this down into a one of sort of where we're at. And, and here's how we nailed down the problem to be identified, or how we identified the problem. 
The legislature's intent is to incentivize properties that are actively engaging in agricultural production. The current classification structure and requirements are not tailored to achieve the intent of the legislature. Now, just to editorialize there, we may want to change that after we've discussed all this today, after we've had some more uh, discussion, and maybe we won't. It just kind of depends on what this committee arrives at. So, first question is, do we have consensus to incentivize property engaged in agricultural pr production? Is that, is the, do we have consensus that that's what this committee should be looking at? Yeah. 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 Say no. Anybody say no? It doesn't think that's good idea. Mr. Director, it seems to me like first we have to define agricultural production before we <laughs> details. You may, you may well be right. Or do you say, well, yeah, that's what we've got to do. We do want to per proceed down a route looking at because I, I mean, I keep jumping back to my case. I mean, to my Situation with uh, 100 trees in the ground here, we have agricultural production. Yeah, and then, and then what is agricultural production? Is uh, either a subset, it's either the chicken or the egg in this thing, right? Yeah. Is there one, there, there's not one clear definition, it's a combination of things. You've got to have intent, you've got to have action. And you've got to have results. And maybe we should go, let's address those things as we get through kind of this parking garage so, items. Yeah, go ahead, Rob. talking about the definition of bona fide. Mm -hmm. So, administrative rule 422601 defines bona fide egg operation as an enterprise in which the land actually produces agricultural products provided under the term agricultural defined in 151101. That directly contribute agricultural income. So then, if we go to 151101, I get there. Robin, would you repeat the site to the rule also? The administrative rule is 422601, and it's part six. The term agricultural in statute refers to the production of food by. Food, feed, fiber, commodities, livestock, and poultry, bees, biological control, insects, fruits and vegetables, and sod, ornamental, nursery, and horticultural crops that are raised, grown, and produced for commercial purposes, and the raising of domestic animals and wildlife and domestication or captive environments. What's that last part again? The raising of domestic animals and wildlife in domestication or a captive environment. It sounds like a throwback to the old bean farm. Yeah. Stuff that didn't get for field farm. That is my guess. Oh, okay. What was, Robert, what was that reference again? It was 15. 15 1, 101. Thank you. And that defines a cultural. So as we're going through the parking garage, maybe the best way to do that is this was really what we wrote up on the board and it boiled down into hopefully better English. And I'll kind of go through it. And then as part of our working group discussion, we should go back to some of these that we feel are necessary to go back to. Does that make sense to everybody? Because this is kind of a recap on sort of what we talked about. So, you know, we talked about incentivizing. What is the legislature, legislature's intent? Uh, there were concerns about the automatic agricultural classification based on 160 acre <coughs> parcel size. <laughs> And then involving non-qualified agricultural classification, should we change or enhance the definition of what is non-qual? And should grazing value be evaluation source? So that's proposed. Basically, should there be different standards for non-qualified classification versus qualified? Then we went on to say maybe we should define what agricultural production is, what constitutes agricultural production. Include a check, maybe include a checklist list of qualifying <coughs> sources to use as evidence to agricultural production. Things like do you file a schedule F? Did you do this? Did you do that? Uh, an example was a schedule F. And then one of the things was should we identify what we want to incentivize? Is it size? Is it production? Is it environmental protections? 
should there be a productive value for all sizes? I'm not quite sure what that meant. Um, should we revise the qualification criteria for agriculture? How do we make ag use priority criteria? Should we increase the in income minimum from $1,500? Funny enough, clear back to 2001 or three, they were looking at $1,500 and, and between then and now, nobody's decided. Do we want productive standards for all sizes? And should there be different standards for non qualification classification versus qualified? Then, of course, other considerations. What about grandfather clauses? Are you grandfathered in if you were such and such? Now we're changing. Are there current loopholes that keep closing? Do we want to create unnecessary hoops for producers to jump through? And can the department implement recommendations? Now I'd actually like to put like highlight that. We need to be able to implement whatever they need. Okay? <laughs> we don't want to create more trouble by trying to fix a problem. So those are the parking garage items. And I think from there, we should just move right into our working group discussion. And I think that that goes right to the questions you, you two raised. Which one's the chicken here? Do we do we define agriculture? Or do we want to? Maybe we first question. I think we agreed that we have a consensus that we're, this committee wants to incentive, encourage the legislature to incentivize ag production. That fair enough. Okay. One thing I feel like I should say though too is I made a pretty broad generalization there too because there are people that just do a really small orchard, 100 tree orchard, and are farmers and do a good job of it. And, Sell eight thousand dollars worth of produce, you know. So it's it's doable, but you gotta separate them from the here I say frauds. City, I agree. Say, oh, okay. I, I agree. though. I'm just saying. Yeah, yeah. We we have to fix it. It's broken, but it's hard decisions that we have to make. And we also have to be confident that whatever we decide is going to be able to pass muster on the legislative floor. Because I can think of a lot of people who would stay away from anything that comes from the Department of Revenue in the name of fixing it. And I would too if I was a legislator. So <laughs> that's why actually this, anything we do here is not coming from the Department of Revenue. Trust me. That's, yeah. that's why we're doing this, right? right. Um, I'm from the government. I'm here to help. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, what, what we've got here, just to make sure we're all on the same page, is this is, is recommendations. We're going to take any recommendations that we do have consensus on to the revenue interim and, and go that route where we've got bipartisan. We've got mm -hmm. legislators already entered up that think what we're doing is on the right track because this isn't a Department of Revenue thing, right? This yeah. is a we, right now, we're implementing what the legislature told us to do and doing a pretty good job of it. But as has been pointed out here, there's a couple of these things that may be inequitable. And that's really my next my next question on this working group. Is, all right, I, I hate to ask this question, but we sat through this today. Is there an inequity we saw today that's worth addressing? This committee feels like it's worth addressing, and I think we better have a, a pretty good consensus on whether or not this committee thinks there's an inequity before we waste everybody's time talking about it anymore. I don't know if you agree. I'll give a few head nods. Yeah. Go ahead. I think it goes back to, I think it was Marcus who actually you know, was asking for some data earlier. I don't know how much money we're talking about. But if we're all gathering to solve a problem that you know, on a, on a statewide budget scale, costs $5 million. That's not a very big number. So I don't know if that's a big enough, you know, if the, if the theory is a big enough problem to solve. I suspect it's a much bigger number than that, but I don't really know. We had, you know, we talked earlier about uh, roughly 25,000 uh, parcel owners in that we're talking about the 20 acre threshold. Um, well, if, if their tax bills on average 
went up a thousand dollars a piece. Well, that's 25 million bucks. All of a sudden, that's starting to turn into real more real money. It's probably more than a thousand dollars a pop. But I don't know if you know that. Do you know that? We can compile, I don't think we have their price. I don't, I don't think we have that right there. Well, we've got a pretty good idea of what we're doing. Yeah, I mean, from the bill graph, we get our stuff. With those caveats mentioned earlier, I don't think we have it up and right now, but it's right. something we could be prepared for next week to kind of show those impacts. So to quantify the impact, we can show. But now here's a question for you. Yeah. Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say that, and that's only, that's one piece of it, right? And the other part of it to evaluate is the, for lack of using a better word, the political capital, it, is it important to demonstrate to the citizens of Montana that it doesn't make any difference whether it's a nickel or a $25 million. Maybe it doesn't make any difference. I'm not saying it has to be quantifiable. If there is a qualifiable, qualifying reason to do it anyway, which is your point about inequity. If it's un unequal for one person, is that enough of an, e an inequity? Well, it is in some ways. Yeah. I don't have any problem being here. I don't want to make it sound like I don't want to be here for not enough money. Right? I, but I think that that's a pretty good way to look at it, at least for me. It makes it easier for me to wrap my head around this. Do I care how much money it is? I personally know I don't really care that much. But I think it's a good thing to have. And we'll get that quantified. And, and it's funny you asked the second question I was going to ask. Even if it's not a huge inequity, if I'm the guy being in inequitably treated, I think it's pretty damn huge. Yeah. Um, it's not very fair to me. Right. But, but it's a different inequity. The guy that's paying full market value knows he's paying full market value. I don't know if he knows he's the guy that's getting the benefit of the non qual treatment or ag treatment, you know, is getting the benefit. He's not complaining about it being that much. Right. You know, and, I wouldn't be. And uh, I don't know if the other guy, you know, on the maps up there, the guy that's paying 100 times more in taxes per lot, he might be concerned or he might not. He might not know. Well, here, here's, you know, the one that jumps to mind, I mean, really brings it home to me is that one acre in Madison County. That has a two dollar tax bill associated with it. Some other person right down the road in Madison County has that same piece of acreage with a house on it, and they're paying uh, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Um, I've seen some of those tax bills in Madison Gallant County, no joke. Um, there, I mean, is that an equity? Is that an inequity? Go ahead. Yeah, I think it's important to know the aggregate of the data and what the scope of the uh, issue might be. But if I look at the maps and the data that was presented, even just in the examples that we've got that disparate the treatment of taxpayers that have adjoining parcels, I think we have a problem. So to me, uh, the aggregate isn't nearly as important as the question of equitability and fairness. So is this a good time to say, do we have consensus that we think we should try to address inequitably and fairness, notwithstanding a dollar figure? But your point's well taken. I mean, she's tripping over dimes to pick up pennies at all. Um, but at the same time, government necessary in some mess in some points needs to just do it right, even if it is tripping over that dime. Because if I'm the guy being treated, I, or inequitably treated, I kind of want it fixed. And I'm not saying I'm being inequitably treated, just as in general. Sure. But the bigger picture would be, do we want to incentivize the agricultural industry in the state of Montana? Because that is bigger than just the production value itself. It's, it's the affiliated industries and businesses that support. So if we can get more incentivization from non qual to, to ag properties and get more businesses generated, where you know that that would maybe promote something bigger than looking at the inequities. 
it certainly adds a good piece to it, doesn't it? it makes it makes it more complete. Because that if you back that around, I think you're dead right, Senders. We've got this non qualis I'm not going to take any advantage. That's what the that's what the legislature gave them. at the expense of agricultural production, which at least I fully believe that when you're actually doing something with ag, you're actually generating part of the economy, you're buying stuff at feed store, you're doing whatever that compounds. So the two kind of go together. Right? Is what I think you're trying to say, right? Absolutely. You did a better job than I did. Well, I, I don't know if any data would ever support that concept that small tracks have anything to do with agriculture or the agricultural supply business and not that of any significance. So, I mean, most of the small tractor people are you know, running a few horses or maybe doing nothing or pulling some of the left of it, this, that. They're not, they're not generating that secondary business, I don't, I don't think. And so, I mean, we're, I, I just think you take all the small stuff and don't even talk about it like it's really A. Let's just figure out what kind of a tax system it should be. It's, it's something, it's suburban property, you know, it's not ag property, it's not residential property. Figure out you know, what kind of a tax system that should be working under and not try to pretend it has anything to do with ag because at least if you stick around 48 with your last, for the most part, it doesn't unless they want to qualify. If they want to qualify, you know, they're, you know, whatever cherry art that's really smiling. Is there a Christmas tree farm or, or a truck garden or something like that? And, and then they're in ag and they're probably doing the that. My Sunday tractor just a big backyard. So, Mr. Director, um, so Bob, do you think there would be any? Um, advantage to try to simplify it and just say we have land and we have ag land. Period. Well, I think that's where I think that's where this is headed. You know, you find what agriculture is, and you either are or you are. There's yeah, some, exactly. Some in between so you, that you get the benefit of when you're not doing so it. Then you don't have any of this non qualified stuff. If you want to have your 20 acres or 40 acres or 175 acres. It's either ag land or it's not. That would solve some problems. Yeah. And 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 in addressing the inequity, it's not just agriculture that's um, being treated differently, but all of those people who are are um, living in urban areas who have houses of value are paying a higher tax rate for that house of value. Than the person who's on a non qualified piece of land. So they are being treated inequitably also. You better be right, right? <laughs> yeah, again, going back, as long as if you made an adjustment to remove non call and put a specific provision to affect how that would be treated on the newly taxable side of things. When you're talking about the dollars, it's no new revenue going to counties or going to state. It's just redistributing and shifting the, the revenue that is currently going to the county amongst a different group of taxpayers. And the equity concern, yeah, it's more equitable that two parcels of non qual and not non qual right next to each other to have this huge discrepancy. You know, one's going to go up and one's going to pay somewhat less mm -hmm. but closer to each other sense. right but it's i think just the revenue in the dollars we can show what that is but as long as the newly taxable piece is taken care of it's not revenue in the sense that there's no more money going right. to your county or whatnot it's just someone's going to pay more and the rest are going to pay a little less right so in 2001 we put together some information for the revenue interim committee and included in that was this notion of what if we eliminated non-qualified agricultural altogether. Mm -hmm. And in that report, it's posted on their website. I'm not on the Zoom, so I can't share my screen. 
but essentially it would create $32 million in new taxes for those non-qualified taxpayers. It would be giving an almost $16 million tax shift away from residential taxpayers, three and a half million to be coming away from commercial taxpayers, 800,000 away from qualified aid taxpayers, and then all the other types would be seeing a $6 million, but they don't have to, have to pay because the non-fall folks would be paying their share. And that that was based on completely in the elimination of non-fall, and that was back in 2021. Uh, we actually, yeah, that is on the revenue interim committee. That's what we presented to them back in 2021. So yeah. we can send you the link to that document that shows you what some of those options yeah, are. Yeah, that would be the tax dollars. So, and I have one other question that you probably know this off the top of your head, right? So, we had these great maps with four parcels on them and very well laid out charts with the fines, but I guess my question would be. As a as a percentage, even though those are great side by side examples, right? If we were to, for example, eliminate uh, non qualifying ag, does are how many properties in it? How many parcels actually see a benefit? versus how many parcels see a penalty. In other words, if, if the tax bill on one property, the extreme one being Madison County, goes from you know next door, one's at $15,000 and one's at $52 or whatever it is, right? Do they both become the same, basically? Are there, are there just as many people getting such a significant break as there are people not getting such a significant break. No, the, the benefits are distributed. It's a collective action. Or yeah, but my, I guess my question is if if the person paying a hundred dollars for that very high value piece of property suddenly has a tax bill that's ten thousand dollars, the neighbor's tax bill doesn't reduce by that much. The neighbor's tax bill reduces by a share of that, right? Right. Are you just, is it a 10 to one ratio? Is it a hundred to one ratio? Is it a three to one? Give, us, Probably. give us those figures again of the 32 million. Yes. How much would, across statewide averages, how much would go to the residences? So essentially, if you want to talk mill rates, the residential <clears throat> folks would see a decrease in 8.88 mills or 15,895,000. So if you think about it, if you're trying to compare this neighbor to this neighbor, yeah. this neighbor's mills are going to go down almost nine mills. And so, no, it's not going to be proportionate that they're going to see a reduction because this guy now is paying a higher. I mean, that's like four to one. Yeah, 30 so it's like four to one. And the makeup of the tax of 400. It's, no, it's, it's, it's hundreds or thousands is the distribution. Yeah. We're talking about 30,000 parcels. Their increased taxes are going to be spread over hundreds of thousands of parcels. So it's definitely magnitudes of difference in terms of how much non qual people are going to be paying and how much benefit you as a homeowner is and it kind of depends upon the county breakup too. You know, if these are highly concentrated in just certain a few counties, then those counties will have a bigger impact than a county that only has ten qualified parcels. But the I gotta apologize. I'm just way into the weeds. It probably shouldn't, because it really shouldn't matter if you accept the fact that you know we're doing this. On a fairness and an equitable distribution kind of level, it doesn't really make any difference. I'm probably spending too much time trying to think about how you actually get it passed. Well, because you have so many people out there who are going to say, Well, my tax bill went down $30, but at least that guy who was getting away with it, at least he's paying more. And that's a much tougher thing to convince people to do. 
Yeah, I was just going to say one thing. I know Bryce had mentioned newly taxable. Does everybody understand that? It's the kind of general concept of why he was talking about that sort of knock on effect. What we're talking about here, then the local government budgeting goes on, or with a quick 30 second rundown help. Yes. Okay, cool. Just wanted to make sure we're all on the same page. Does that mean we want a 30 second rendition? I saw a lot of people nodding their head. Yes, they understood that. Was I, mean, I got 30 seconds. Okay, all right. So, really taxable when a, a local government, they have 15, 10, 4, 20, which governs how much money they can generate for the local government purposes. Uh, it is subject to limitations. Newly taxable property is not something that goes into that equation for a year. So if all of a sudden this non-qual property in the example we're talking about here goes away and you have a parcel going from the $2 to $15,000 under current law, 15, 10, 4, 20, that wouldn't be counted for the local government budgeting purposes. That year. That year. Yeah. So they would be allowed to increase their their budget, budget and levy more bills based on the increase in taxable value. But that becomes their new baseline. In the fall, in right. the following year. Right. But the, the point being is that this conversation about what we're doing here, you know, this hypothetical of eliminating non wall or any other changes, there are a lot of other knock on effects, in particular that 15, 10, 4, 20, and a local government's ability to raise the, the money that they need to provide those essential local government services. The, the short the short of it is, is if you don't fix the law, they don't this new revenue doesn't require them to lower their bills. Yeah. Right. That first year. Mm -hmm. And now well, and 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 yeah, then, yeah. And that's, that becomes part of the base that yeah, right. that's, so that's kind of how this thing of Budgets have grown greater than the two percent of the per half the three year average that four twenty requires. So, oh, thanks for all of that. Sorry. No, no, that was that was an important bunch of questions. Really, it's what what is this actually doing? I, I don't think there's not been a bad question or an off base question said in two days, guys. Well, so that gets back to your grandfathering question. <laughs> the legality of could you say, well, this only applies to properties after we change ownership from this point and you know, keep your non qual as long as you own the land. Is that right? Well, that sounds like California Prop 13. Yeah, well, it, sure. does. <laughs> it does. Yeah. Sorry, Bob. But, but it <laughs> might be the only way you get this thing to walk, you know. Mm -hmm. And and that want to disincentivize people from selling property in general. Mm -hmm. yeah. More like that Prop 13 thing. Uh, <laughs> but now, legally, the legislature could come in and change qualifications or classifications, qualifications, tax rates, you name it, pretty much without. Limit. I mean, I, I don't mean to be to live about that. I mean, there are limitations on what the Constitution allows the legislature to do, but the Constitution has been pretty clear, the courts have been pretty clear that the legislature has the right. They wouldn't be forced to grandfather something like this. Is what I'm the short My answer. Question was, well, they, we, could you legally do it? Could you legally grandfather? Yes. I don't know why you could. Well, we have basically. But then you're not solving the problem. This equal treatment. You're right. That's a different issue than legal. Oh, okay. There's all sorts of legal stuff that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but I would suggest that uh, rather than a grandfather, you might consider a phase in because grandfathering perpetuates the inequity. It's a disincentive to sell. Uh, whereas if you phase it in, you can gradually, again, fix the problem without the initial shock in a single year. You know, if I look at, again, the examples that were provided, I'd be hard pressed to say, you know, $50 compared to $3,000 on adjacent parcels is worthy of being grandfathered. You're saying it wouldn't be worth it. I don't think it should be phase. worth it. Yeah. But the phase, it makes a lot of sense, right? So I don't wake up tomorrow with a 10-fold. I don't think you want to tax somebody out of land and that's one of the 
unintended consequences potentially. So, so I think we do need to consider how do you how do you deal with that? That might be more amenable. But I, uh, you know, we have a history with phasing in some of the assessments previously. Maybe consider something along those lines. There's a lot of thought that one because otherwise it is as been, been said a number of times even the greatest idea here has to come has to get through 150 class presidents and yeah, you got to make that powerful right careful it's we got to get this to work right okay. I mean, it has to be saleable to not only not only the 150 of you but the but but the people you answer. Yeah. And that phase in idea is, I think, makes a lot of sense. Um, so I'm sitting here saying, now what do I do? We're really talking kind of two things. Mm -hmm. You've got this non qual thing, and I don't know how else to describe it. And then we've got the greater ag thing. And I'm asking, are these two things, or are they inseparable animals? I think we could separate them, and it might be wise to do so. Just like the governor always says, you win football games with a four year place, not when Mary passes. Um, because the, a separate issue is the automatic over 160 acre qualification. But I do think we can separate them. In, I mean, I don't think we need to tackle them both, or maybe we do two separate bill proposals if we do try to tackle both of them. So they're related, but I, I think they could be handled separately. I, I would like to know if there's an appetite for focusing first on the non-qualified egg piece, which is, you know, those acres between 20 and 100 and well, really anything, I guess, yeah. under 100, yeah, 20 to 160 that don't qualify for acre ducks, right? So the, the question before us now is, do we want to tackle, does this committee want to tackle that issue? Personally, you know, no, my, my opinion, that thing, that's actually part of the elephant this committee can probably take a bite out, a good bite out of, if, if, if there was the stomach to do it. And frankly, technically, technically it'd be a lot easier than defining agriculture, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. Um, so, should we make that the consensus here? Should this committee tackle the non qual issue and try to arrive at some better form of equitable treatment among these parcels? Did I phrase that in anything that makes sense? Go ahead. I just want to point out that there's three types of non qualified property owners. There is the person that just happens to have a 20.02 acre parcel that they put their house on. There's the person that might have 80 acres that is legitimately trying to graze that land, but just doesn't have enough animal unit funds to support that. And then there's the irrigated guy that doesn't want to put in an application because then his value goes up as irrigated land versus grazing land. So there are three different types of non qual property owners. I think we need to be careful not to lump them all together as one. That's well said, because there are a couple of those that need special attention. Go ahead. Sir. And if we subsequently tackle the issue of how do you define agriculture, you will solve both of those problems. Because yes, to me, in my, in my opinion, the, the person who is grazing but doesn't have enough AUMs to, to qualify it as traditional agriculture it doesn't mean that they're not still raising cattle and and like I said intent action and results you know you've got all three of them right there and the person who's got an irrigated piece of property that's 157 acres and selling fifteen thousand dollars worth of hay so why not get qualified as agriculture for God's sakes I think if the consequences of not applying become greater than the consequences of applying and getting the irrigated classification, I think he would. Right. Yeah, I, I so, think that so then you're really, so then you're really only needing to deal with that first category of non-qualified. 
the other two, we could incorporate into our definition of agriculture for diesel. John had a question. Well, well that's just what, what I wanted to say. That's kind of why I proposed the idea of so many dollars per acre of production agricultural income. It doesn't matter if you own 20 acres or 20,000 or 200,000. If it's a dollar amount, you can earn that on that through an egg, an egg procedure, whatever it may be, you should be entitled to the egg classification. But that's legitimate and it's actually very simple, which, well, and it seems fair to me. Yeah, I, I mean, you see who sent me here. I'm, <laughs> <laughs> I'm kind of here for the bigger picture. I mean, but, but nonetheless, there's a lot of 20, 60 acre parcels who like sentences or raising hay or are grazing cattle. They can earn that certain dollar amount for eight. Well, I'll give you an anecdote here. One I looked at pretty close just the other day with our gang. <laughs> there's a parcel in the county at seven acres, two acres, okay. and they had 2.7 acres, and they had seven horses. Seven's in there somewhere. <laughs> seven horses on two point seven. Yeah. What are they eating? He was feeding them. Yeah. He, was, he, was, yeah. he had these horses. He's raising them and he's feeding them. He's, and part of it's irrigated, but it's, it's a small parcel, right? And that's some irrigated ground. He's obviously buying hay and he's feeding horses. But this person is an equine therapist for PTSD soldiers. And he's got a he's a certified therapist. He's raising horses, he's raising them on this little piece of irrigated stuff. He's buying hay, he's feeding them, and he's using these horses in his business. And I would argue a very commendable business. And making pretty good dark, darn good money. Way more money per acre than I made it. And the Department of Revenue said, You're not at. We didn't go commercial. Um, and I took a really hard look at this because, uh, of course, we're, we've got this committee going on. I'm thinking, well, these horses, the guys feeding them there. Well, there's a lot of guys that raise cows and feed them in the winter, too. And we just got the, got the revenue way more than the $1,500. But the statute has, an, the, the acreage has to carry that minimum number of AUMs mm. by law. I mean, the legislature wrote it in there, so I don't get to override that regardless of whether I think he's commendable or not. And so that person is still residential. It's a residential classification, right? Because the legislature's got a uh, law in there that says you have to have so many animal units per acre, you have, your acreage has to carry those AUMs, and it doesn't carry enough AUMs. So even if I like the guy, I don't get to. But I'm reading that, and I'm saying, well, he's raising livestock. He's irrigating some ground. He's using those livestock in a commercial capacity, which is in the definition of agriculture as it exists right now. You guys tell me, is this, is it, despite, and, and, and kind of, we're on a court on, but because I can't override the statute. But you guys tell me, is that, is that an agriculture? Well, that, that's a good question. If you were selling those horses and getting income from the sale of horses, I, I think that is agriculture. But it's the same thing as what if you have um, raised seven horses, you're not selling them their box room or them or training them and adding value and selling them. Um, what if you um, just let people come on and rodeo and charge a rodeo? Is that agricultural? And you guys say that's not. That was going to be my next question. What and, do you do about the guys raising rodeo steers and racing them out? Right. And feeding them. On, on a small track. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Bob. So the reason the 30 on the AUM 25 or whatever the calculation comes out of it is to get to $1,500. So, you know, to keep people from having 10 acres or 15 acres and going down to the sale barn and buying two animals and put them on there for a week and so on back sale barn and selling them and gross them. $1,500 with the close of loophole. You know, you, you're not running a feed lot. You've you're got a pasture for this. You've got to have enough grass to generate $1,500. And 
put a bunch of cattle on there and feed them hay to generate their income. That was, if that was, that was the theory. It is. So you can't plug it loose. And I'm not saying theory is wrong, right? But it can, there's there's these one offs that will make you crazy. Mm -hmm. And if, if I raise a rope and steers and rent them out, am I, am I not a cowboy? Am I a commercial guy? Um, Do you qualify it as saying you have to produce an agricultural product as opposed to, okay, someone that just raises horses for racing? Is that agriculture? It's a good question, right? That's kind of why I brought this up because if that's the question. Then it comes back to our definition of agriculture. Right. Yeah. Did, did yeah. we get that definition copied and distributed? Because it pretty much tells you what agriculture is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're we're yeah, showing up on the screen. Don't throw it back up on the screen, and I don't know. Did you have a comment? No, no, it's just this is the dilemma that we've got to work with. And there's a pretty good argument, as these guys pointed out to me when they were being cross examined by me on this case. Uh, maybe this thing should be, should be commercial. This, this individual is generating real money, right. and, and, it, and, he's, and he's got a business. This isn't a this isn't a hobby. This isn't a game. He misses. He's doing it for real. And I'm like, that's just... <laughs> it's kind of like three uh, um, landscape replacing you know, self tree greenhouse and self tree grow our neighbors. They're growing plants and materials and they're selling them. Like, Find large they're commercial enterprise ready because they're not. Uh, Right. So, is the stock contractor a commercial enterprise? Is the greenhouse a commercial enterprise? Is the right. equine therapist? Yeah. Are they not a? This thing, you know, the more to chip this thing, the worse it gets. But I just bring that up because there are some kind of funky one-offs out there that that are for real, and they actually affect a real person making a living. But I think now that we're back, let's see. I think we'll, since we've got the definition of ag up there, let's keep talking about that before I go back to our equity. No, that's good. But are raised, grown, or produced for commercial purposes? That's mm -hmm. what I mean. That's what I was questioning on this this whole thing. Yeah. It, it looks pretty commercial to me. But he's raising livestock for a commercial purpose, which is agrotherapy. Seems Same like as it fits, doesn't it? Yeah. Well, nobody defined commercial purpose today. Bring it down there. <laughs> I doubt it. But I, I think, you know, I don't know how you could argue. I, I, I'd be willing to entertain somebody to argue that what this guy is doing with his equine therapy thing isn't commercial. I mean, he showed us he's making it. He's got clients. It, it, it looks like it's a business. Well, then raise, um, raising them to have people come in and do rodeo. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's where this, you know, we worked down this on this ordeal we went through the other day. We went down that road trying to figure out what's what here. And I only raised it to show you there are some things that we're, us in this room, I never thought that uh, before. Well, it turns out it's a real taxpayer and they've got a real thing. <laughs> and that would probably include raising bison for agriculture. Yes, any agriculture. Yeah. Only if they're domestic. <laughs> so, by definition, they're domestic in Montana. If they're not wild, they're domestic. If they've ever been. Yeah. Yeah. So, like the APA yeah. they brought these, they're, they're livestock. Domestic. And that, that's one of those things we always do want to be a little careful about with. with Looking at entities like that is it they could always buy some of our livestock in the state of Montana. They're not really, they're not wildlife. That's right. And so is letting those puppies wander around the Missouri breaks. Right. Like, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Juan. Uh, we got to have to tell you the heroes. We have some. I, I would say I've looked at agricultural production across a lot of states in the definition because we just started incorporating in our conservation easements 
a requirement to keep the land in active agricultural production. And what I found common among a lot of these um, definitions wasn't that term for commercial purposes. It was that you're raising them to market and sell their offspring or the like the bees and the honey, that the, the uh, whatever might be produced by whatever it is that you're raising, but not an experience. Correct. So does that totally mess up? So the, the, so the, so the, so the, the agrotherapy, the agritourism wouldn't fall in the definition we're using in our conservation. It's, it, it really is intended to keep when I think of production, it's your you're selling offspring or you're <coughs> selling honey or whatever you know it's being produced, which adds to the economy in the area. You know, the mark marketing of products, not a service. Correct. So, so that's the so marketing of products, not a service, or or their byproducts like um, hides. Uh, you know, you selling offspring byproducts, fiber. So wool from sheep. What does that do to the dew branch? That wouldn't qualify the dew branch. I'm just, I'm just asking. It wouldn't qualify the rodeo arena. It right. wouldn't qualify yeah. the agrotherapy or the agritourism. So, so the dew branch is qualified for just running enough cows on his branch. Yep. Mm -hmm. But if Which he's, uh, if he's a packer, he's going to take on horseback rides and doing whatever. He's got a bunch of mules and a bunch of horses that he's, and I, I don't care. It, that's a commercial operation, suddenly 160 acres or not. So I just think there's a difference between commercial purpose versus a that's a choice that this committee would have to look at is how broad do you want agricultural production to be? I mean, you could include commercial purposes and then you're really gonna broaden what's captured. So you think if we're gonna go down that road, we would need to define commercial purposes as it as it pertains to agriculture. This, this definition, if you stick with it, which is in Title 15, general definitions, is broader than in the broad one. And would we want a narrower for purposes of benefiting from a agricultural lower tax structure versus our commercial tax structure? Right. There is a you know sizable difference. Sizable. Did I know you had mentioned breaking apart you know, some different issues and potentially tackling the, the non qualified land issue? So, I guess just for clarification, are we going to look at that and the definition of agriculture land? Are we going to tackle both those issues and tackle them separately? I think we talked about doing it that way, Bob. Did you have a comment? Well, I think you have to do that some type of egg, unless you're just going to say, if you're 40 acres or less, you can't be egg unless you meet the definition. And then you throw all that into, into class four property, residential, commercial property, whatever. You know, unless people prove that we're back out of it. Right now, the left 160 is the number of the arbitrary number of two. I mean, it's basically a section, a quarter of a section of land, even though not, as you found out, most 20 acre tracks are 20 acres, and most quarter sections are 160. Um, go ahead. I guess my kind of a follow up question was maybe I misheard, but. I don't know if you posed the question, do we want to tackle the definition of agriculture? And it's the answer, yes, we do want to tackle that. I, I, think, I do think we have to take a look at, because um, to qualify for agricultural land, so under 160, you ought, to be able, you ought to be able to qualify. We have to put some parameters on what is qualified. And agricultural production can be one of those you know, yeah. parameters, which is a little narrower than this definition. So let me try something here. Just 
You guys want to help me on this? So we got, I'm going to say this, but it's going to finish with a question mark, but I don't know how to say it as a question. Does that help? <laughs> Rising inflection. <laughs> Do we want to attack the inequity on, and I think the answer to this is yes. The inequity thing on non qual versus qualified, I think is a, is a, we have consensus, we want to try to solve that. Why don't we ask the question? I mean, do we have? Should we? Do we have consensus? Does anybody not want to do that? Gotcha. I, I, and I thought we were. Do there we before. see our people online? Is there anybody online that disagrees? Anybody online? <laughs> Mr. Chair, there are no members online. Okay, well, I hope that makes that easier. All right, so we have consensus we are going to attack that issue, non qual versus qual and inequities. Is that an okay way to put that? Number two is do we have consensus that we want to revise or explore revising the definition of agriculture as it pertains to land classification? Anybody not want to do that? And I say I don't want to do it because I think it's going to be really hard. <laughs> but I think we got it. Okay. Are those two questions? Uh, and then here's the third question. Is that enough for this committee to deal with? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. That is almost the <laughs> So back to your uh, second question is that regardless yeah. of property size, the question of whether it's agriculture. That's a good question. Why don't we have a little conversation about that? Did everybody hear representative things? Question What does everybody think? Well, it goes back to yeah, the no, I think, it, I think it definitely is, is regardless of the size. And if, if that's the case, then that kind of falls in the first one between non qualified and qualified. To me, you know, we really don't need the non qualified if they're uh, smaller acreage producing agriculture. I, I don't know. I, I say it right. I, I think I'm with you. I, I, I hear what you're saying. It actually makes a lot of sense. Maybe they roll up. Go ahead. So, uh, so I would just want to follow up. Does that include 160 acres or more? Because right now that's an automatic assumption. Yeah, I think your your agriculture. In my opinion, is that you mean that they have to prove productivity? Yes. 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 yes yeah, I think so. I no, think. and sadly, you say regardless of what we come up with, there's going to be loopholes, and we're going to create some jobs for some dirty. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because people are going to, people, they're going to say, okay, you don't qualify. People are going to find some loopholes. They're going to hire an attorney. They're going to go argue for that. Some of them are going to win. I, well, it's, it's a tough one to, to solve everybody's issues. Everybody's different. But what, what you bring up actually makes sense because it, to me, just, and then there's a question mark after this. A lot of the reason we're here is, public perception we don't we can't quantify it but there's a whole bunch of sizable acreages we can be taken out of production and there's not ag production going on um what was otherwise a real land regardless john's suggestion there will probably be loopholes in there somewhere but that would cover uh, as john said that covers basically everything from 19.9 acres to 100,000. If we could figure out the right way to come up with that dollars per acre, or however, how, yeah, that's a tough qualified threshold is. Yeah, yeah, yeah and that's a tough one, right? Because yeah. a dollar per acre is a little different between his cherry orchard and my oh. sagebrush. <laughs> so, what would the default be? They, they don't meet that threshold. What would the default? That's the next tax. question. Classification would be. I mean, if you eliminated non qual it would be class four. That's the There's class four residential is the catch all plan classification. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if you want to talk about the ranch, so the ranch isn't going to be 3,000 acres isn't going to be residential. Well, it's going to be unless you wrote something to say it wasn't. If you just struck it, you'd be track running, right? Mm -hmm. In my mind, the, the larger producers hopefully don't have a problem proving up, you know, a certain dollar amount of productivity. 
I mean, you can't make them excessive for that reason. Uh, and it's going to be the smaller landowners who probably struggle a little more. And, there, and there's a question, just, and I don't want to put you on the spot here, John. When you say, say a smaller producer, there's some people in here that aren't in ag. What's your definition of smaller producer? Well, I, I guess what I, what I meant was when, I, when I'm saying that is the smaller than 160 acres. Oh, okay. Obviously, to me, you know, if you're trying to make it, Ag control so they're not two thousand acres. It's going to be darn hard to do. So they're a small producer too. But uh, it's it's easier to show one thousand dollars of income on two thousand acres. If we're talking like as it as it sets now, it's fifteen hundred dollars. So put that in perspective, one hundred and fifty acre place. That's ten dollars an acre. Easy enough, you know. And if we own fifty thousand at ten dollars an acre, we have to show five hundred thousand dollars of gross income. Which, my gosh, if we're not doing that, you're not making a living on 50,000 no, acres. No. We're talking about gross income. So, right. yeah. Well, that's not a huge dollar amount no. to me, but it's a, it's a start, I guess. Mm -hmm. Mr. Director, I think we have to pay attention to in definitions because they said the following types of property are not commercial. Number one is ag lands. So, <clears throat> We have a circular argument here with no clarification as to the definition, detailed definition. I think when we're examining that, that's one of the things we have to try to fix. Because, yeah, those chickens and eggs, some Scott's work, some don't. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Well, uh, just another part of the farming would be if you were to consider is there a certain minimal amount of acreage or maybe land that could be less than an acre? That would be, be able to qualify. And I think this has come up with the legislature before and they said they could set it in there. Well, but there was a point in time in administrative rule we tried to say you have to be at least greater than an acre. Yeah. And because the statute just says you have to meet the $1,500, we can't impose anything the statute doesn't allow. That might be what you're thinking of is at one point in time trying to limit it that you had to have at least an acre of size. Well, uh, we had no authority to do so. Uh, contrary to what statute says. I, I mean, for instance, I I know of a farmer slash rancher that he had a sheep operation and he couldn't qualify for excess, so he said heck with it and just put in 100 carry trees. You know, next to his sheep operation, and now he's good. So, um, <laughs> is that bad? He's an harvest of cherries? Uh, he, yeah, I mean, that's right. I don't think he's making any money in the cherry business, but um, he's a farmer, you know, so I can't, can't make any uh, complaints there, but um, but I just, I guess. I'm just saying that uh, something to think about it, it would be this if there any minimum at all, and you could have a, a, a 2,000 square foot greenhouse that's producing $20,000 worth of hydroponic tomatoes. Yeah. Technically, those don't qualify. <laughs> they don't qualify. Okay. Sorry. They would okay. be grown in the ground. Okay. Well, Not hydroponic. So, so the high, those hydroponic deals are commercial. Okay. okay. But okay, well, or did you want anyway, to say a small operation? Go ahead. Oh well, yeah. I, I think that's that's good to know. But it did, in other words, you could produce way more than fifteen hundred dollars. Uh, something less. Than that. So that was the concern last year. Before one department, they didn't think they could enforce a one acre rule. Well, like, Came to the legislature, came up with like, if you sow herbs and stuff in your garden in town, you could probably make fifteen hundred dollars, and then with your lot in town, be agricultural. So that that kind of was a question that was posed at that time, and never actually solved the final like, gets to your minimum. Yeah. So what? What can't be a 
even if he can produce in a lot of something, probably should, like anything. You can't say anything inside the boundaries of the city because, like, even a filling land in the city that's not incorporated in the city and people are grazing livestock on it, farm it. And the other one is if you, you know, you get back that 31 annual end or whatever it is, I mean, you can get an acre in Montana and you can have 160 acres of golf production, 31 annual ends, and it might be owned by somebody who inherited it from their grandfather who homesteaded it, and now it's not a part of somebody in the middle of somebody's ranch in the right. Is that because it's being used for agriculture? Those are minutiae things to get the big thing figured out, then you can worry about all the little things. So let me run this thing. So we've got these two things. Maybe John's suggestion solves the whole thing. Should we explore trying to use John's theory to solve the whole thing, or should we bring a couple of subcommittees to do that and 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 the separate issue of of non qual versus qual? Or what do you guys want to do? How do you think we should? If I had the answer, I'd tell you. Go ahead. Well, I would say let's prepare two definitions of agriculture. One that's geared toward producing goods, narrow down the current one. If you're in agriculture, you're producing a commodity, something you're producing. So the other one is more broad, like this, that let, well, will let you do trail riding and guiding and outfitting and agritourism and stuff like that. So I really think we'll do it. Two different types of agriculture. Not some are combining some on. So, on that line, should we make an agenda item for our work group next go round to try to work up those definitions? And what we could do is we could have our thirty. And I, I'm asking. I'm not telling you. Anything. We'll work. We work. Have my gang work up some answers to some questions we have here. And presentations on besides what else other presentation would we like? Go ahead. Should the definition that we choose to use for agriculture dovetail specifically with the intended uh, the intention of the legislature to incentivize or encourage agriculture? In other words. Do we, do we need to worry about the hydroponic tomato farmer or the herb grower in his yard? Is that, is that really the intention of the legislators to, the legislators to protect the poinsettia farmer? <laughs> See what I'm saying? Yeah. Because know. if it's not, and I don't, I, I guess, I, I don't, I don't know, but I, I, it certainly doesn't strike me as being something that they're generally worried about, right? Or we're worried about when we create the definition in the first place. And if that's the case, then why should we? I, I guess I'm not too worried about coming up with a definition for agriculture that makes sure that um, that we're worried about so many niche things. You can't even imagine somebody or creating a system in which Lots of people decide all of a sudden that I could buy a bee farm online and stick it in my backyard. And all of a sudden, that's a commercial or an agricultural use. I'm not sure that we want to define that, do we? Does anybody have an answer? <laughs> I don't. Can I maybe add another wrinkle to that? This definition that we have already looks pretty comprehensive. So I guess my question for us as a group is. Are we trying to narrow this definition and wouldn't that de incentivize agricultural production? If the idea of our work is to incentivize, I mean, I feel like this gives a lot of opportunity to end, for people to enter into agricultural production. Do we need a new definition? If we need a new, new definition, I'm not sure what we add to this that makes it better. So, my question is, is the intent of the group, do we want to narrow it? I guess I'm just kind of I have more questions, maybe similar to John, and I apologize for that, but I'm just a little confused. 
Or he has better stated than what I said. Or in our <laughs> charge, we need to take that definition and say, okay, this is going to apply, and the administrative rule is going to apply to all parcels regardless of size. And what's the impact of that? I would also come back to your first question and say, I think this is an important conversation for the committee. But I think if we have capacity and time, it would also be important for us to take a look at the bill draft that was produced last time regarding qualified, non qualified. So that we as a committee ultimately at the end can say, are we going to consider advancing a definition of agriculture and how we apply that definition? And are we going to consider advancing potential legislation on qualified, non qualified? And we can decide both those questions. So for an agenda item next, and I'm, I'm asking you guys if this is going to be it, for an agenda item next next month, should we have a presentation? We'll have bill draft, the last bill draft for you, fiscal note, and some explanation on how that bill came about and what was behind it. Would that be a good presentation for everybody? We're talking about the last second. Yeah. Never was an official bill draft that got introduced, so there's right. no fiscal note. We can still do the analysis it, but there will be no fiscal note. Now there was bill drafts from 2017 that addressed a number of these issues that we could actually present one as well. Would that be more beneficial to everybody, a little more comprehensive? Okay. Or, or maybe both. I mean, we did have a draft of the bill. You're right. It was never introduced, so it wasn't an official draft. But I don't resist. I don't know how close that is to the time. And I've got whiz kids here that probably <laughs> dummy up a, a missile note. And, 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 is that a yes? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're talking about the one that you couldn't find something to do it? Right. Go ahead, Mark. I just think we're at the point now. You got to put stuff on paper and start talking about it. Yeah. Right? So that's why I'd say get two or three different definitions. We can decide if we like them or don't like them, whatever. Get some bills, get some ideas out there. Once it's on paper, then you can shoot holes in it. No longer talk about stuff. Yeah, I'm with you. That's kind of why I'm thinking that if we go this route, we've got, we can talk about the non qual. I think with these definitions, um, Rob had just asked if I if, if I should propose should we put a definition subcommittee together or should we be our own subcommittee? That's and I'm not saying it's a bad idea. Or should we be our own subcommittee next next month and and what do you guys prefer? I don't know which one would work better. I like having it on paper. And looking at it as a group on paper, okay. and we can distill it from there. So I'm going to ask for volunteers on the definition subcommittee. Then, first place we have consensus that we need a subcommittee. Yeah. Yeah. On definition. No. No, I think we got to do it here. Okay. Yeah. Right. So and who do you want anyone to... who wants to present to the department ideas of a definition, if you run across good ones, just send it to me. Okay. You de you decide if that's something you want to work with and bring it back. Or... So so am I hearing this right? You're asking or. Ask yourself, right? I'm, we're directed, which you can do, directing us, the Department of Revenue, to show up with some ideas of the definition of agriculture. Oh, we can, this and we can send you ideas too. Sure, but they'll be presented by us. Right, and right, right. Yes. Somebody can shoot us definitions, we'll try to put a couple of things or a few things together, and it, we'll present it next go around and we'll work from that. Go ahead, Bob. Well, I would put them together and send them back out and look at them. Okay. okay. First time we're seeing the next time we're all sitting down. That's yeah. Kind of like, yeah. This this set of homework that we had from this time around is great. Yes, thank you. Great to have something to pre read. Yeah. And that's our plan. Yeah. The next yeah. time we'll yeah. send we'll send this stuff out here a week in advance. Yeah. yeah. So it's, oh, it's okay having it a week in advance. And we'll we'll yes. we'll have something coming from us and we will have something put together for for everybody on that. Mm -hmm. that, that if anybody sends us something, we will have those together. You'll give them a week in advance. And the agenda item is to discuss and try to hammer out a potential revision to the definition of agriculture. That was your job? You bet. Okay. And kind of you're giving me that suspicious look like no, I'm just kind of the touch on Marcus and where we narrow it down or expanding it. I think to close these loopholes, we have to narrow it down. Don't you think? I mean, we have to make it. At least broad as possible. Yeah. I'll just say one thing like 
agriculture doesn't have a dollar amount in this definition, that $1,500 is found as a second requirement to qualify under the <laughs> section. Right. So, I, in, yeah. Are there um, any other additional statutes that couple with this that support the definition of agriculture? So, well, 157201 and 157202. I will get them out to you with all that together. Go ahead. And I guess to your comment or question, I think it's just as important for the, the general definition can be broad, but I think the definitions of what does not qualify is important. Like, like North Dakota has a section that says if you don't qualify for these categories, you're not ag. So, like, as it's written out, domestic animals. So, could you be a dog breeder in your house? You're selling domesticated animals, so or guard dogs, right? And it's I actually know of one of the issues they've got over sure. in your neighborhood are these dog training grounds that they're training bird dogs in the Flathead Valley and qualifying for it. So, dogs aren't livestock, livestock right. is defined. It is. It is the fun. <laughs> yeah. But it's not in Title 15. Right. But if you're training no. dogs, you probably got two cattle to train. <laughs> These are bird dogs. I don't know. Yeah. They're, they're, the pheasants they're raising are raising their livestock. I'm not sure how that works, but I, I've got here for Oh, one. there it is. Okay. It means cattle, sheep, swine, goats. Uh, you pulled that from the livestock market. That's the same title. Is that a livestock? Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. it's it's a type of hostage. Oh. <laughs> so, Lieutenant Governor Bass, when you first, when you first uh, read that, to read the last sentence again, and then had some concern in wildlife, is that what you like to do with wildlife? Fast. Domestic undulate. Oh, yeah, domesticated. Well, I don't see it up there, but yeah, there was something you could yeah. one in. If you look at 5101 yeah. 1A 2 I, that's kind of what I'm Yeah, that would be here in Elgin. It had to be in a captive environment. I thought it said yeah. something about domestic environment or something. And wildlife domestic livestock includes bison. That, well, that has to be all over from those game parks, doesn't it? Yeah. And yeah. So back to our agenda items, we'll get some presentations on that a week out. We'll get everybody some draft ideas on definitions. Do we also want? So the summary. Oh, you are so lucky. <laughs> the summary that we also sent out kind of Thanks, is recaps what the qual current qualifications are to be eligible for agricultural classifications. So that's the back. It kind of touches on the administrative rule and 157202, but it isn't a full representation of that session. So, for the second agenda item, should, we, we, should my crew and anybody that's interested try to come up with an income definition, an income threshold definition that we can distribute a week out and hammer out? That one would be a question. <laughs> I just plugged in an inflation calculator. Fifteen hundred dollars in nineteen ninety is almost four thousand dollars today. I mean, inflation has changed that. I guess I go back to John's question about: Do you instead look at some productive value per acre or some income per acre rather than in the flat to a flat? And then, right. so, and then when I was getting to the minimum acreage, it should be a just a minimum dollar amount too. I mean, so if we extrap extrapolate down what John was saying per acre, it works great for 50, 20 acres. Then you get down to one acre and it's like, oh, you only have to make 75 bucks. You know. <laughs> so maybe a certain minimum. So my question about the dollar amount per acre, because I don't think it's a bad idea, but what Brendan was talking about, if he's got, 15,000 acres, and now you're only running 200 cows because you're semi-retired, but you're still running those cows. If you look at dollar per acre and 15,000 acres, I, I wonder how that 
plays in. Does he now become ineligible because he's reduced his herd? Or maybe there was drought or some other reason. So the dollar per acre, think about how that works. And that was one of those things that there was a bill introduced last session that defined whether you were a cowboy or not as to whether or not you were running at some percentage of the AUMs per acre allowed like by PLM in that neighborhood. It was something like that, wasn't it, Bob? I don't know. Um, well, drought's huge. I mean, yeah. what, what you, I mean, if times are still good, your grass is green, you can lease it out. The dollar amount should still not be going to come back. But drought, that's, you know, that's another <laughs> one. You may want to rest your ranch for a couple of years. You know? so, yeah. so that's, that was kind of the problem with it when I, when I looked at it. And I had, you know, he might be dropped. <laughs> but as we know in Montana, sometimes you have long term drought. That requires a major stock for a while. Yeah. Or say you're aging, yeah. you don't really feel like being that busy. Yeah. <laughs> I, know. Uh, well, I think you can figure out a little circumstance if I, you know, if the county declared a disaster area or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, you can you can find some triggers to say, well, as long as that's happening, you're all bets are off. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're, okay. you can maintain your status. Or if you fail to meet the threshold, you have a five year average that we yeah, the threshold. Yeah, they yeah. in a 10 year production number. Well, we just I feel terrible is if we're doing all this great work and we have collateral damage of somebody that's really in the, in the business and they just, for whatever reason, got trapped. Yeah, that, and then they look at they look back on these meeting minutes and they don't say, "Well, John Lewis." <laughs> <laughs> and then they're waiting for Gunny Q. Yeah, well, I don't. I do not intend to make this difficult for the property owners because I'm one of them, and for the producer out there. But on the other hand, I don't think it's something we're scared to have to do if it's not a tough for us. Yeah, I, I just think we want to make sure we don't have innocent parties collateral damage in this because we didn't think of that situation. Right? And that's what bothered me about that one bill. It seemed like there was any collateral damage in there. Well, one of the things um, just coming from the farming and ranch community also is the the need to prove up on a regular basis. You know, we should have a one and you're done unless A, B, or C happens. Yeah. It shouldn't be an onerous project year after year or even every five years you know just if you're in the ranching business you're in the ranching business and unless something dramatic happens or you sell your place you know so i think these are all good suggestions we need to put in on that second agenda item um, because i think we should get on to public comments so yeah. everybody can so are we okay with agenda items and, and presentation items and we'll get an email out saying suggestions We'll get some suggestions in. I'll work with Lieutenant Governor on any of her thoughts. Jared, you asked your hand up next to Oh, yeah, you're good. Now, I just wanted to point out that um, going back to the dollar per acre thing, John was talking about, um, if you look at Oregon, it's the only state that I looked at that has something similar to that. And they also kind of scale it to it. If you have less than six and a half acres, $650 is required. Six and a half to 30 acres is $100 per acre is the requirement. And then more than 30 acres is $3,000 revenue requirement. So you can look at that. More than 30 acres, or say that again. Yeah, more than 30 acres is a $3,000 revenue requirement. No matter how big it is, oh, it's just 3000 So we can do something different, but you can look at Oregon. It's the only other state that I saw that does something so okay. So what we'll do here is we'll give till 2.30 or less of the comment. We'll do a quick recap and get everybody on the road. Is everybody all right with that? Go ahead. Can we have a date for the next week? That was what I was going to do at the very end, okay. if that's okay with you. So we'll, we'll run until about 2.30 on public comment, if not, if So I'll open the floor to whoever's got public comment. Well, I know a lot of you, some of you I don't, I know most of you actually. Molly Cullivan, I actually hear from Montana Cattlemen. I'm supposed to have a blue plaque and sit there, but I couldn't make your first meeting. 
could resume at Monroe County when you learn. This is also the man who taught ag law for 20 years from the law school, 25 years teaching natural resource and environmental law from the graduate school, and 20 years teaching land use law for the graduate school and the law school. My county attorney is a deputy special otherwise for 37 of the 56 counties in the state. That's two thirds of Montana. So I know this real well, because also every right to farm ordinance in Montana, I wrote the template and I wrote almost every one of those ordinances. You want a definition of agriculture? I would tell all of you to do this. Look at Lincoln County's definition of the right to farm ordinance, Wheeland County, Mar County, Prairie County, the Prairie County, and Beaverhead County. The state's definition, they copied off some of that stuff. It does not include silviculture, which Lincoln County does, which is raising trees, seed trees, whatever else, Christmas trees, all the other fun stuff. It also does not include the guys who raise shrimp and fish in Tulsa. There's a guy in Big Park and a guy at Charlotte who raised shrimp. You don't want to know, even think about how much they sell their shrimp for per pound. The other new people that are raising cash crops in Montana are on that little map right up there called Cannabis Control Division. <laughs> the man who runs 10,000 acres of ground per year with a hell of a lot of cows, I'll tell you this, a greenhouse and one acre of that makes you more than you make up a thousand head of cows a year. Mm -hmm. Scary thought, but that's the change of agriculture. Oh, so. A pink grizzly farm is one acre of the middle of Missoula, sold by Klaus's, that's Taylor Brown's sister-in-law's family. By the way, it's Taylor's wife's family in the middle of Missoula. And by the way, they're horticulturists, which is agriculture. They raise seed plants, seed trees, corn herbs. They sell Christmas trees all over the damn country. They're open all summer, and they sell fireworks for the years in Fourth of July. Just for past talk. So there's a whole lot of agriculture out there. So look at those definitions. One, that's the first thing I said. Two, the history in 1973 that the legislature took up later was actually a function not of preserve agricultural use. It was preserve agricultural opportunity. Because the concern was if the price of water is too much per acre, we can't irrigate anymore, no more egg. If the price of the taxes are too much per acre for whatever else, we can't do egg anymore. We have to sell out. The push was hell in the cattle stall in Missoula. The first three places when they did the subdivision and planning act in 1973 that took advantage of occasional sales, boundary transfers, all the other stuff there. So what drove this bus? For how we were going to do this was that change from the 73 subdivision and planning act. And remember, it was 10 acres was exempt, then it became 20. But it became 160 in 1993-94 when Roscoe signed the bill. I just want you to remember, those people were not speculating, but every ranch in Missoula County, most of River Valley County, most of Lake, and most of Flathead is 20 acre parcels. Because the courthouses were open till 2 in the morning, the day after. He signed the bill to record all the deeds conveying 20 acre parcels just to do it for family transfer purposes or to save the legal description because when they went to 160 or less of the subdivision, everybody said, let's save what we can for planning. I'm not kidding you. Look around Missoula the next time you drive through, look around Bozeman, look around this county, look around Billings, every damn ranch was 20 acre parcel just about. It wasn't speculation. What it was is they changed the law and nobody wanted to put up with it. So that's the history of providing opportunity, and that's what matters. So the tax rule is basically not to say you have to do agriculture. The issue was if the taxes are too much, you lose the opportunity. But the taxes are low enough, then you have the opportunity. So let's preserve that. And there are five P's that get you in trouble. There's seven to a land use planner. Proper prior planning prevents this poor performance. There's five in the legal world. You can provide, you can preserve. You can protect and you can prevent. If you do those things, nobody's going to sue you in court. Brennan, I'll tell you this really well. They're not going to sue you in court for doing a taking for being unconstitutional. But when you promote, you're suddenly taking things. You don't want to do the promote P word. You want to prevent, preserve, protect. Those are the things that this was created to do. We weren't promoting agriculture, we were protecting agriculture, we were preventing harm to agriculture. We're preserving agricultural opportunity. That's kind of the focus we end up making the rules by, and you know that as well as any, well, because I remember those discussions with you in the 80s as well, in the conservation effort, about what the difference in the P's was. That's the word. So the third question then becomes, by the way, the issue of use of what's on the place was a really big question. I will tell you this, the largest one piece pane of glass in the world is 38 feet right to left and 19 feet tall. In one piece of glass. It's on a ranch in the Great 
That's longer than this room and wider than this room and wider than one thing standing there. Is that necessary for agriculture? Is that ancillary for the use of cows? Is that a collateral thing? Probably not. And the first time this question came up, the head of the Montana Tax Appeal Board, in those days, it's back here, I just knew it was crazy. But he removed the discussion well. What happened was a whole bunch of people had whorehouse prices for potatoes and they don't need potato sellers. The revenue came back and said, oh no, these are not agricultural. These are commercial. So we're going to tax it with a higher rate, industrial rate, because these are potato farms. Potato farms are brand new, not just part of agriculture. So we did the tax appeal for growers in Hamilton, growers in Polson, Charlotte, Oman, et cetera, and Twin Bridges. They took it to the state and said, wait a second. These are agriculture. There are collateral uses necessary to raise seed potatoes. Because if you don't store them until February, March, we can't ship them to Idaho or Washington because they're being kept cool and dry and alike. So we had an argument is what's collateral, what's ancillary versus what's not. And lo and behold, we won. So those new grain bins, those brand new potato sellers are part of agriculture. So to me, the split on qualified land, non-qualified land really is the hard question. And I appreciate Robin's work on this for a long time because it's been a hard decision. How do you decide if a $5 million house on the two-acre cherry orchard is part of the agricultural operation? Is it ancillary? Is it collateral? Or is it a $2 million house with a way to screw the system over time and get out of taxes? That's really the question right there. So maybe the hard thing to look at is in the definitional part and more than that and how we do this. And this is really hard for you. How do you decide? How do we decide what's ancillary, what's collateral, what's not? And that was the purpose. And that's the discussion. And I was very glad he was back here because we had this conversation. And Liz said, I remember you doing that. Yeah, because we decided those potato sellers were necessary for the agricultural operation. It wasn't a luxury. We had to have it. It's like that 30 by 60 shop. It's necessary when you've got a $300,000 tractor or a $900,000 combine. This costs more than the house, by the way. But anyway, so those are the real questions that end up confronted in the definition of the rest. Fourthly, I love your idea of what's a bona fide property, bona fide agricultural operation. And I know that all of you, and I have this conversation with the Senate governor, the governor, every time the governor's ag committee meets once every two months, and that's always fun. So here we are, the stock growers, the cattlemen, the wool growers, the guys who raise beans, et cetera, the grain growers, and I always smile politely and say, look, we're 152 people short in this room, and there's a stunned look at me, and I say, look, Governor, please go to the farmer's market next Wednesday in downtown Helena. At five o'clock, walk into the park and see how many people there are producing flowers, squash, tomatoes, herbs, forbs, whatever else. Every one of those persons is an agriculturalist. And there's a lot more of them than there are me. There's a lot more of them than there are all the stock growers, all the cattlemen, and all the wool growers put together. They're all agricultural. So this acreage size, the money size question, I do not want to step on those people. Because I agree firmly that their vegetables have a place on God's green earth right between the beef steak and the potatoes. <laughs> That's where it goes right there. And I need those carrots for that in your life. Plus those potatoes. It's too we like those. So please, in terms of what bona fide is, we've got to do that in the definition. The 90s change was a really big question then when we started to see the issue of what's going to be agriculture now. Missoula, Kalispell, the hell when I had it first, then Bozeman started to get it. I remember when little Bozeman in Montana had a cowboy band every night of the week on the third floor of the Baxter Hotel, Sunday day. You would punch a thousand lights on their swings. You could go to Bozeman and there'd be a band every night of the week. There's a cowboy band upstairs. Find me a cowboy band in Bozeman. There are damn few. So it's changed starting in the 90s incredibly. And that's a huge, huge difference from what it was. But we still have agriculture the same way. And that's what we need. So in terms of the definition, that's what we should have. One other note. Only one state in America, and those right farm workers who say this, only one state has a constitution that recognizes the Department of Agriculture and Livestock and recognizes the importance of agriculture in the state, and that is Montana. Yeah. So when I listen to any of you say, should we do this, I go, people, let's start with the basics. Read the damn constitution for Montana. It was a brilliant piece of work in the early 70s. But if you're all just clearly what we're talking about, what you do, what we do, those of us who do it, 
Lo and behold, are we the essential part of our custom, our culture, our history, and our heritage? I thank you for the effort to do what we're doing. We're trying to get there. And I wouldn't make the first meeting, but time gets to be a weird thing when you don't put a computer at all. And like I told 42 graduates, it was 10 years ago. Global warming is a big deal for all your strides. Oh, yeah, it's terrible. Global warming is the worst. It's miserable. 42 graduates. And I said, fine, you can call me 24 7. Because I know very well the number one wine in Montana now is not from the greenhouse to wine you over Mile City. It's not from Tim's with the rattlesnake. It's the one you hear at Wally's cell phone at 10 o'clock. <laughs> Wally's cows were on the credit throat tonight. It is on the bottom of my PMW. That's the number one wine in Montana. But aside from that, I answered the phone, but none of them realized that. They said, that's good archaic. I said, yeah, but here's the news. I don't run the internet at all. My carbon footprint for the internet is zero. There's 42 of you in class. I want your carbon footprint right now, one at a time. Tell me. You talk about 42 depressed looking graduate students. We never thought of it. That's not good enough, class. Well, nobody told us that before. That's not good enough either. You need to think. I want to know next week what your carbon footprint is, class. And it went well. So I don't do that thing because my carbon footprint, just to prove a point to those students, is, is absolutely zero. I call me 24 7. I will get my cows or anybody else's cows off the road because I know the birds will like ever stay pretty damn well. <laughs> but thank you for the time, months. I'm sorry to take a minute, really, but I kind of like the, the person who's sort of here but not here. And I know the history because I taught it for so long. Went to graduate school in New Zealand and wrote how to do the land use plan. I'm a University of Montana grad, otherwise, in the law school art, too. So that's a Montana kid who walked two blocks in the first grade, still lives in the same house. It still does the same thing with just as many cows and just as many bad horses and ox teams as he ever had. <laughs> Thank you all of you and stick with it because you are preserving our custom, our culture, our heritage, and our history. So I really appreciate that. Really, thank you much. Thanks, Wally. Is there additional public comment in the room first? Oh, Pat's got nothing. Pat's got nothing. All right. <laughs> Anybody online, Bill? Nobody online, Mr. Chair. All right, then we'll close public comment and we'll have um, our plan. Bill, I was trying to reach for my hand up, but you clicked past me too quick. <laughs> Whoever that was, go ahead. Steve Smith. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Steve Smith again. I uh, also spoke at the first meeting and I plan on attending as all of these meetings as I can. I am part of the 31,000 people who is in the non-qualified ag land now. Uh, my property has been in ag land production, as I said before, since the 1880s. In my father's name, the specific 40 acres since the 1990s. And if we're talking and discussing the definition of bona fide agriculture, actual use of the property, the inequalities in the production value, <clears throat> I think there definitely needs to be a focus on the definition of bona fide. I have the reference and I do meet it. The income and definition or change of bona fide should be reached. The 160 acres and above doesn't have to meet this definition. They automatically get the exemption. If you change the uses and inputs of what you do to your property, like what is listed on page 17 of the manual during the application process, such as the details of your operation, the description of your operation and what you do with it, that would change how the land is classified by its actual use. There wouldn't be any acreage breaks. There wouldn't be this irrigated hay or irrigated grazing example that's been discussed several times, but classify and actually verify by use of the land. Because when we're talking about using the carrying capacity or production value of how it is currently being calculated, there are several flaws in that spreadsheet. I'll just put one out there. Any of the producers in the room, how many of you have a 10 month grazing season? Okay, using the web soil survey to determine the stocking rates for any of us small acreage producers is grossly conservative and has been expressed as for so that we don't have to destock during drought years. Well, who stocks a place for drought year calculations? And this came directly from Professor Mosley, who 
develops this document. Now, gross income is simply that. It's gross income. The spreadsheet is flawed. But if you use that, even if you use the $1,500 value, even if you raise it to $2,500 or $4,000 to account for what it was in the 1990s, the definition of agriculture has enough holes in it that you cannot come up with an actual value of some of the commodities that us small acreage guys could be producing. There's nothing including in that definition of meat that is derived from livestock grown and raised on your property that you're selling the meat. You can only sell the livestock. But I thank you very much for this meeting because in conclusion, inequalities do exist and they don't just go one way. It don't only go the way that of people getting breaks for ag land that is not in production. Please do not forget the people that are using land for bona fide ag and are getting removed from or placed in non-qualified. My personal tax bill went up $1,000 when I got moved from qualified to non-qualified ag land. That might not seem significant to a lot of people sitting in the room, but to me and my budget, it's very significant. My income from my agricultural production wasn't great, but it paid for my insurance and propane fill before winter hit. I want to thank all of you for more of the discussions that were had at the end of the meeting. And at the end, excuse me, because of the incentives for people that are in agriculture, whether they're large acreage or small acreage, I'm small but I still buy fence posts, barbed wire stock tanks, and contribute a lot of labor in my production agriculture. There is nobody around me but other ag producers. I may not be a major player, but I'm still a player. And thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Is there anybody else? Not seeing anybody online, Mr. Chair. Nobody online, nobody else. All right, let's... Uh get through the last item on this thing. Maybe we should do that on the next one. That will we'll be a little better organized on schedule well, because that might go to that, that definition. Better. And then we'll get to a little better preparation. So did, uh, what is this, the second week of February? Third week, whatever. Um, any suggestions? Should we do the, the what, second Thursday or Wednesday? Oh, wait a minute. Second Wednesday of March is going to be our other group, isn't it? Scott? What works for everybody? Somebody give me an idea. I'll be online, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm busy sitting, so, but I, I can make anything work. Okay. One side or the other or your other. Group. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. 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 I think there's this one. Last one was Wednesday, so this should probably stick to Thursday. Sure, sure. Go ahead. Uh, the 21st and 22nd, Thursday, Friday, we have revenue income. Okay, so should we do it the week before that? 14th of March. It is February, right? Is that Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Um, it's just one person, but I would be gone on the 14th um, and not able to Zoom, but I could do it earlier in the week on the, that week. Sure, do the day before the Wednesday because that wouldn't probably interfere with. See? It depends on when the other committee meets. Right, right. And I guess. Uh, they haven't decided. I don't know. It, have they decided to, to do or it? Or they can pitch to say they can't do it since two of us are already predisposed. <laughs> you know how much weight I carry over there. Not very much, just so you know. So, what did we say? The 13th? Is that what we said? Thirteenth is Wednesday. Yep. Scott? As far as I know. I was the same boat. I'm going to say the sure 13th. Going once, going twice. Scott's still talking. It's going to be I have a two o'clock, but I am happy to be here. Right up to the minute of that. Great. Let's, to my kind of call. let's shoot for that if we have to adjust. Because, I mean, it's pretty hard to plan around somebody that hasn't planned. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been good if they had done that yesterday. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm not the chairman of that committee. Things can be run like this one. They can, it'll take Wednesday next month and they can have Thursday. There we go. 
Perfect. So let's do that. Does anybody have any specific information requests beyond what we've already talked about for my group? Go ahead, Bob. Uh, like say those definitions, those county definitions. The county definitions that Wally talked about? Sure, I, I bet Wally would talk to you, so, so you could get away from it. <laughs> you know, tell me if you will tell you. So we'll get those definitions that, that Mr. Cogman talked about. Just for everybody's information, I'll go on. That'll be good. That'll be good. Then we have to get our recommendations and ideas into you. Right before a week before. Right. What if that would be? I can't see. It. Whatever the week before that is, the sixth. So yeah, we'll try to get the agenda out the sixth and seventh. So if you guys can have your recommended definitions to us by the end of the month, end of February, then we'll have time to put some ideas together. And nobody has anything else. I sure want to thank you all for coming to be a part of this. We're we're moving. It's uh, my first time driving one of these buses, so I apologize for my inadequacies on it. Go ahead. Director, you did it right before lunch, but I would just again recognize the staff. This is uh, some pretty significant work, and I'm really impressed with the level and depth of knowledge, especially on the spur of the moment when we come up with questions. And I just want to thank them all and recognize them for their expertise in their Thank you very, very much. much. Thanks to everybody. Call me anytime, email me if you need anything from me. Thanks, everybody.